to the second session of the day. I, I would like to request. Okay. I would like to request convener Dr. Sriti Rathan Tripathi to kindly introduce the first speaker of this session, Professor Shonjit De. Uh, thank you. Professor Shonjit De is uh, representing University of Calcutta since 2005. He is member of National Academy of Sciences and currently holding responsible administrative positions in his university as well as other research and academic institutions. He earned his academic degrees from the University of Calcutta. He was visiting scientist at MD Anderson Cancer Center, Houston as DBT Overseas Fellow and Postdoctoral Fellow of University of California, Los Angeles, USA. His research interests include innovative real-life therapeutic research, human health care, subcellular organelles in health and diseases, innovation and value-added teaching. He is a member of various prestigious bodies like Research Advisory Committee, Center for Research in Nanoscience and Nanotechnology, University of Calcutta, IUS Council, Government of West Bengal, National Academy of Sciences, India, etc. He is actively involved in science popularization and outreach activities. He is regularly extending the outreach activities for the first generation learners in tribal communities along with his team. He also organizes health and hygiene awareness camps for the caregivers of intellectually disabled. Sir, please. Professor De, please. Yes, uh, very good afternoon to everybody. So I hope, sir, everybody is uh, doing well. Uh, with their uh, self and with their families. And uh, I would like, uh, like to first uh, thank uh, the principal of uh, Borampur Girls College for uh, organizing this uh, excellent seminar and, and also <coughs> uh, obviously conveners and the excellent team of the conveners of, the, of uh, that college. And they are very active and they are untiring uh, working for last couple of days and and for a couple of years also so they have organized many uh, nice uh, you know seminars and meetings earlier and uh, you know that uh, so this was very much required i mean uh, with regard to uh, you know the pandemic situation now so everybody and our learned speakers are, earlier they have mentioned very nicely that i mean the, what is the you know gravity of the situation and all and what are the and a lot more to come Okay, from our uh, uh, other speakers. Now the context is that, you know, uh, first of all, this COVID has taken, you know, many, you know, eminent personalities. Even yesterday, we uh, lost uh, some eminent scientist and uh, an eminent scientist. And the day before yesterday and the, uh, in the last week, we, uh, from the physiology fraternity, we lost a uh, uh, very bright, you know, uh, uh, one individual that is uh, Professor Dr. Uma Ganguly and Dr. Preetin Banerjee. And a few days back, we lost our, uh, our teacher, uh, Professor Vishwanath Kole. So I uh, just, uh, I pay my homage to all of them and to all the diseased soul and uh, for the, during this, uh, uh, you know, the pandemic. Very unfortunate that we are not able to, you know, uh, do our uh, and uh, pay their last uh, tribute to them. So unfortunately for us. And uh, now I'm going to present. Uh, so that is my one of my, you know, pleasant duty. And also I would like to uh, present uh, some of our work. I mean, the how really, uh, the, uh, I mean, the how far this pandemic is, uh, you know, we should be concerned about. I mean, uh, <laughs> I'm not <laughs> diluting the issue of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the pandemic thing. But the issues are, I mean, there are far more, you know, important issues that I actually I have identified so that I want to share with you. And I might be wrong. I might you, you can have some arguments against my thoughts. All right. So uh, what I say and I actually, uh, you know, you know, sent that uh, abstract, submitted that abstract. And I have written in the very first line that it was uh, the non-communicable disorders. So this is my title of my talk the non-communicable disorders uh, favor communicable disorders, diseases in women. Is it uh, the tip of the iceberg, really? Or, I mean, what? 
or it is just nothing okay so we can just shrug it off and uh, essentially the in my background of the, uh, the abstract i uh, found a very astonishing fact that the non communicable disorders take toll about 71% uh, of all global death okay so just imagine that figure the 71% of all global death is being taken by the non communicable disorders you know all taken together and <clears throat> the questions are what are the non communicable disorders that means those some of them those are not immediately by the some pathogens not by some bacteria not by some kind of viruses or by some kind of uh, you know amoeba or some kind of protozoans okay so they are essentially being incubated by us some way either by our habits or some kind of predisposition already that is some those uh, some of them are non modifiable okay like our age okay <clears throat> so we cannot do it but we still it is a non communicable disorder okay and the communicable disorders yes that uh, some of them yes obviously we can escape but some of them uh, we cannot <clears throat> like <clears throat> non communicable disorders the very fact is that the cardio and the cerebrovascular diseases cancer respiratory diseases and the diabetes are such uh, ncds or the non communicable disorders which account for about 80% of the premature death in the world all right and the indian women share more than half of the fatalities from these ncds so the figure is really uh, you know we have to ponder about all right and on the top of it that indian females are plagued with some far more infectious diseases okay and the transmittable diseases uh, like tb and other respiratory gi or genitive urinary tract diseases and these are all you know all communicable diseases in the women so those are not immediately those are not so prevalent in the uh, among the men and essentially the most interesting part is that that apparently communicable and non communicable diseases seem unrelated however so that is the question so whether uh, is there some kind of synergy or not so actually so this is i am just going to share some of our work and some of our uh, you know thoughts and i am representing my uh, 150 year old university and uh, from the 100 uh, more years uh, century old department and <clears throat> and i am representing i am very proud to say that i am uh, saying in the platform of the physiological society that society once uh, was patroned by uh, professor uh, you know you know r m uh, rabindranath thakur and also uh, nilodhan sarkar so i and also uh, uh, in the sc mohalana bis and many other stalwarts so i am very proud that i am sharing this platform and i am uh, very uh, glad that i am uh, being associated with this you know physiological society all right and some there are some key facts that uh, i would like to share as i mentioned that uh, from our laboratory uh, on the women in the urban kolkata and india actually this uh, uh, why i uh, have taken this uh, you know initiative because when i was in government service uh, <coughs> west bengal education service uh, working at hugli mohsin college uh, where i found uh, sriti ratan as my student and they were their batch was ex, uh, i how, how can i explain it they were uh, kind of uh, excellently you know they are you know uh, approachable they always approached with any uh, tidbit issues and all and they were so much associated with us in you know, all the teachers that it was very much fascinating and that actually made the you know uh, my job more you know uh, more, more pleasurable more uh, for rest of my uh, teaching uh, you know life that much i must uh, add, uh, you know acknowledge to them i must i acknowledge to these to my student community there and there are some key issues i mean the, the key issues are the, whether <coughs> the non communicable disorders their biomarkers their communicable disorders and their what are their biomarkers and the female so okay i am not teaching going to teach you the all the physiology and all these things but i would like to share uh, whether there are some synergies are there and uh, and whether this kind of you know uh, apparently there are some uh, dichotomy uh, exists but whether this dichotomy actually Uh, is working uh, you know or facilitating each other or not so that actually that came in my mind and i i would like to share and these are some of my publications so uh, actually the, uh, when i was working in the uh, hubli mohsin college i applied for a project to dst department of science and technology government of india and science and society division 
and um, when i was associated with a very famous uh, you know endocrinologist uh, in india uh, professor anup kumar misra so he was uh, then at the all india institute of medical sciences and he actually encouraged me to work uh, on some you know women's health and some niche areas on the women's health and that is essentially was untouched and he told me that that is the post menopausal women and aged women and the geriatric population are uh, is far far neglected most of the icmr and the family welfare uh, you know funds are being for the maternal uh, and the child health okay so why not you consider this so i then i uh, taken initiative with some of my msc students okay with uh, i did some projects with them and uh, got some very preliminary data though but the, that gave us uh, some real quick uh, you know uh, kind of picture in and around that location and after that it, it was the structured project uh, that actually went to you know dst and essentially it was funded and i am very fortunate to say that i was part of you know five centers that were chosen okay so one was the delhi uh, and another was the haryana there it was rural and urban another in the punjab rural and urban another one in the pondicherry another one in the pune that was uh, rural and uh, urban so just to say you know uh, just to see that you know entire picture i mean the dichotomy of the picture in the rural and urban thing and in the in that segment what was the age range age range was essentially for the post menopausal women however we were we discussed uh, a lot on that and we uh, kind of a brainstorming session were were held uh, before that those meetings and it was actually uh, the uh, the age was from 32 to 80 because why this long range because just to see that incubation pattern of this you know comorbidities whether uh, or not if there is any because you know all in most of the cases with the economic transition and all so india has seen that uh, there was some kind of you know uh, huge toll from the diabetes from the hypertension from the obesity okay so it was as such there was no structure study at that point of time all right and it was uh, the economic transition was uh, you know inevitable uh, so after 1995 uh, or so it uh, started but after that it you know it actually brought out uh, brought about you know many you know uh, international companies like uh, kfc burger king like uh, mcdonalds and all okay and all, all the fast foods and all these things came and many you know all these you know automobile company uh, you know uh, came and they have started uh, you know uh, giving uh, started you know placing their cars on the road all right so what has made that what made, the indian citizen actually were uh, have become more kind of more kind of sedentary because they uh, you know burned less calories after that all right so that's why perhaps after that they incubated many other things and you see the title the major dietary patterns and their associations with the cardiovascular risk factors among women in west bengal so i would uh, like you to requ uh, request you to go through all these uh, articles so these are very fundamental findings we have found that with some specific uh, you know food pattern uh some specific you know uh, age group is incubating this kind of you know cardiovascular risk factors not all even it was very surprising that interestingly it was a lower age group that is from 35 through you know around 45 and uh, 50 around within 50 so they, they were incubating this you know cardiovascular risk factors interestingly with their you know unique food pattern because of the fact that is there these people are these are the urban this was done in the kolkata so this uh, age group was actually were habituated with the you know fast food all right fast food and the you know convenient food kind of thing and they are in the job obviously and rather most of the you know after 45 years of age they are not so incubating because they were kind of in traditional diet kind of thing so that was one of our you know <clears throat> understanding and from our finding and we also found uh, you know uh, we cross sectioned uh, our data like anything and we found some risk factors for the hypertension in the population based sample so we in some niche uh, uh, sample size we found that there was hypertension uh, there are some in post menopausal women the hypertension was there and it was actually correlated with the age so it is quite obvious so it is nothing essential nothing uh, so new another thing was there and after that it was very surprising with uh, this data the association of the inflammatory markers and the cardiovascular risk so this is actually uh, that's why i told uh, i kept that term that whether it is tip of the iceberg and at that point of time we saw that it is it is that 
the inflammatory biomarkers are high, uh, very high, and it was uh, HSCRP and uh, other uh, immunological markers. Those were high and actually promoting the cardiovascular risks. I mean, those who are having the more kind of apolipoprotein B and the you know dyslipidemia, so they are having more you know inflammatory markers among them. So this that's why uh, it was really uh, you know uh, you know kind of uh, alarming situation at that point that we predicted. Sorry. And the another thing, so it was from our you know group data. It was actually uh, from these uh, publications. The rest of the publications actually were uh, taken in uh, into the policy uh, decisions. And for the population-based intervention for the cardiovascular diseases related knowledge and the behaviors in the Asian women. So we actually also carried out not only the clinical and the dietary data itself, but also their knowledge, attitude, and the practice. That is also known as the KAP. So that is very very crucial at this point of time okay so not only our practices it is also the attitude and also our uh, our knowledge so how we are going to you know implement it so i think with these seminars and all if these uh, you know issues if these you know uh, teachings are being percolated to our household uh, members so that would be the real thing that would be the you know the success of the outreach of these outreach programs okay and <clears throat> So it was with the famous Rajiv Gupta and also the uh, uh, Professor Onu Bistra's group. Obviously, this Onu Bistra and the Nabal Bistra Bikram was also there from AIMS. And uh, th there is also another interesting study now I find that is uh, in this, uh, you know, after, uh, during the pandemic period that COVID-19 and the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, another domain that I work with. So, and we find that uh, there is, uh, you know, two interesting pandemics. Okay, so that is perhaps it is somewhat, you know, jargon they have used. But I won't, uh, you know, keep that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease as the pandemic. But it is definitely, it is a very, very, you know, alarming situation. Uh, obviously, as a whole, we can uh, see the larger picture that is the NCD. That is far more dangerous. Not the non-alcoholic uh, fatty liver disease alone. All right. So now these are the, I skip the cartoons and all. So non-communicable disease management in vulnerable patients during the COVID-19. So this is one from uh, Saurabh Basu. He is from, uh, uh, also from AIMS. Uh, so he published in uh, Indian Journal of Medical Ethics. I find it a very interesting article from him. And also another, that high prevalence and the low awareness treatment and the control of the hypertension in Asian Indian women. So people actually uh, leave that hypertension issues. They neglect the hypertension. They don't measure the, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, blood pressure uh, regularly. So that is a mandatory thing. We have to have, this is inexpensive thing and we can uh, get rid of that burden like anything. Okay. And it is very, very interesting from in the current scenario because the migrating husbands and the changing cardiovascular risk factors in the wife, a cross-sectional study in Asian Indian women. Quite interestingly, I found that, uh, sorry, I have written that in the abstract that when that uh, people the the wife of the migrating uh, people uh, migrating family are they are going from the rural to urban so they are kind of getting more hypertensive so that was their data from the from these migrant people uh, across uh, the delhi new uh, haryana and uh, another pune so this has happened though so this uh, actually paper article so we have not we have not worked on that uh, in kolkata because it was essentially done on the urban people so that is very, very interesting. And when these people are going back, though it was a very small number, that is the urban to rural, the hypertension issues were not that great. So that was a kind of statistically significant thing. Okay. And now again, I am coming back to COVID thing. Okay. Because otherwise, if I don't say COVID today, because people will not leave me. All right. So people are actually uh, trying. Trying to correlate with the, okay, what are the co comorbidities and what, are, what things are not with the COVID situations. Are the COVID, so please sir, tell me now whether comorbidities, the diabetes, hypertension, obesity are related with the COVID or not. So that we want to listen. Yes, they are. And they are not only the COVID, there are the TB, there are the, you know, other uh, respiratory diseases, there are other, you know, GI uh, infections, all are, you know, dependent on these, you know, comorbidities. So that is, that's why I want to, uh, you know, uh, agree, I actually, did, you know, agreed with, uh, you know, Sriti Ratan when he invited. All right. So just to share with them. So as you see that the, this is the, you know, very common symptoms and you see the figure, I'm not, uh, you know, reading it out uh, once more. The fever, cough, dyspnea, uh, anosmia, that is the uh, smell, uh, loss, loss of smell, 
myalgia of the fatigue and the sputum production, sore throat, headache and the diarrhea. So these are the figures that people are suffering. And there are complications, these ARDS, uh, thromboembolic uh, events, the acute cardiac injury, acute, acute uh, kidney injury, uh, some kind of shock and the secondary infection. So these are also, these are the percentages. So they have identified. So this is frontiers of immunology, very recent, you know, I think it is, it was published last, uh, uh, last month, all right, in the month of August. And this is a very interesting data. The prevalence of the pre-existing comorbidities among the hospitalized COVID-19 patients. And the prevalence of the pre-existing comorbidities determined from the, an extensive meta-analysis of about 80,000 hospitalized COVID-19 patients. So there is, uh, you can rely on this data uh, rely, because of the fact that the, this is a meta-analysis and uh, uh, of around uh, 80,000 people. And you see that the hypertension, 16%, the people with hypertension, they were affected 16%, cardiovascular, they are uh, about 12%. COPD around less than 1% though, diabetes is around 8%, chronic liver disease 3%, chronic uh, uh, kidney disease it is uh, less than 1% and cancer less than 1%. So prevalence of comorbidity is essentially hypertension, cardiovascular and the diabetes. And now these, uh, why they are scoring so high? So that is the question. Okay. So now you might have, you know, heard of uh, all these things uh, because uh, you know, the cellular phenomena and all. However, there is something, there is, what is the synergy and what is the, you know, uh, where lies the, you know, uh, hand in hand, uh, you know, uh, connection because of the inflammatory, uh, inflammatory resolution. And that actually, uh, you know, calls for the, you know, mildness and the severity. Some people are, you know, escaping just from the hospital. Okay, so from the emergency, they are saying, okay, so you don't have any, you are just running nose, you just stay at home and you just stay uh, in the home quarantine. That actually Professor uh, Kushal Das is uh, now having, uh, perhaps he has been, uh, you know, exposed with some uh, positive person. So that's why he has been quarantined. Okay, I hope that uh, he would recover very soon. And so, uh, and even I might be also asymptomatic person. I never know. I have not, because I have not de uh, developed any serious, de de uh, you know, symptoms. So that I have not gone to the any uh, clinic and I have not gone for the COVID test. So I may have the COVID uh, positive, uh, you know, COVID antibodies in me. Okay. And <clears throat> all, but however, some of them have a very unfortunate, the ill-fated one. So those are developing, you know, the hyperinflammation and the cytokine storm. And this is very unpredictable situation. However, there must be some one-to-one -one relationship. There must be some kind of that, uh, you know, science actually, it is not so, you know, black magic. It is, there are some, uh, you know, one-to-one -one relationships are there, all right? So that's why they are developing the pneumonia, ARDS, septic shock, multiple organ failure, and drastic loss of the CD8 uh, T cells, and the also the NK cells and the, uh, sorry, sorry. What happened? Just a second. Oh, sorry. Uh, somehow, okay, I just, <laughs> I just got off uh, from the screen. Right, can, you, can you see me? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. 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 Uh, so why this is happening? Because of the you know presence of the widespread uh, you know AC2 receptors. It is angiotensin converting enzyme uh, you know type 2 receptor, and also there is a, it's a, it has another you know uh, friend. I would say friend that is the TMP RSS2. So and also known as the furin protein. So and this furin protein when this furin protein is you know you know you know you uh, know when it is uh, uh, you know. Uh, proteolytically cleaved, so then it actually binds the SARS-CoV-2 can bind very easily with the AC2 receptor and it can mediate the internalization process and followed by the endosomal, you know, uh, internalization and also <coughs> its replication in the host uh, ribosome and also and their next uh, set of events. And where lies these all these kind of uh, receptors? Essentially, the nasal root and obviously, and it is people are saying that I and the also obviously the lung, the lung epithelial root has got, uh, you know, huge uh, uh, abundant, uh, you know, AC2 receptors, though the kidney has also, uh, you know, abundant AC2 receptor. However, 
that uh, you know it essentially there is the root of entry might be the kidney <coughs> and that means through, through the nasal or the eye okay and <coughs> okay so this is actually also the story of the cytokine storm that actually happens in the in the casket of the injury in the lung and uh, this uh, as i mentioned that is the you know the vascular leakage clotting and the inflammation that follows and actually that fills the lung after the cytokine storm actually it uh, the you know the lung there and the, all the our <coughs> macrophages there so they try to you know protect ourselves protect our lung and but in so doing they actually create some kind of you know uh, barrage of activities so they kind of uh, make that kind of cytokine storm and making the things much worse and making the alveoli fluid filled and respiratory distress follows uh, follows and also the platelet aggregation which and uh, followed by the fibrin clot which actually gets the you know the clogging of the uh, you know artery of the uh, <coughs> capillaries of the um, uh, lungs and this is another this is the some kind of uh, you know treatment regime the schematic representation of the sars cov 2 cycle air of epithelial cells so I, i can skip it now for the time being because i have uh, <coughs> told uh, the uh, the major background of it and this is uh, one of the article uh, famous article that uh, just published uh, last month uh, in the physiological review that plasminogen increases the pathogenicity of the cov 2 uh, sorry the covid 19 the plasmin actually basically it is a uh, prote uh, protease and it cleaves the s protein of the sars cov 2 extracellularly increasing its abil uh, ability to bind with the angiotensin s2 receptors and to elevate the d dimer and other fibrin uh, degradation products in uh, both the bronchio bronchoalveolar lavage fluid and the plasma which essentially decreases the platelets and uh, results in the hemorrhage so that actually creates the you know turmoil okay so this uh, actually for some of the patients some of the as you uh, perhaps it was there that uh, the pneumonia ards septic shock and uh, multiple organ failure starts uh, they are from okay from the severe patients there all these things okay and uh, so now we need to you know say something about the you know our lifestyle so now we have our automobiles the fast food so i uh, read one famous article in lancet uh, long back i think in 2015 it was letters to editor uh, from the chinese group it was the, called the fat so fat so is the fast food fat so bolke ek to movie bhi ho gaya to it was but it is not that movie it is the uh, fast food uh, automobile uh, television smoking as uh, it is the smoking so that is the fat so and after that after this economic transition in everywhere particularly in the south asian countries so this is uh, the fat so event But the fats of phenomena actually has worked nicely, okay? Because we have uh, we are more kind of uh, you know familiar with uh, uh, with the uh, what should I say the fast food, and we uh, had more income in our pocket, so we had our you know uh, automobiles and uh, also the uh, mobiles and also the uh, you know television in every household. Uh, household and also the smoking so that is also it is a personal choice though so but all these things actually incubated uh, all these our comorbidities at a, earlier we had the televajas things all these things right so at that point of time we never heard of you know diabetes and all these things in 1975 780s or something like that but it all came after this you know uh, uh, it was there perhaps it was perhaps not detected but <laughs> actually i <laughs> just picture this famous uh, you know telebaja uh, shop it is very famous in kolkata that's why but we were we were very much uh, have you you know practiced with all these telebajas right so we never developed it uh, not like uh, blood pressure and all these things were there however we had cancer it was age old disease blood pressure was there but it was not so kind of uh, kind of plagued the society that much i i want to convey okay and why this thing has happened why this comorbidity is came it is perhaps that gene diet and lifestyle uh, thing there is a very very you know the synergy is lies there actually this is a very famous model i actually borrowed from uh, professor frank booth of washington state university i everywhere i show it uh, uh, maybe it is somewhat irrelevant but i think it is you know very much you know uh, you know uh, teaching it uh, for everyone because you see that uh, if we when if we uh, push our health ball to uh, with our physical activity we keep our health 
and if, but if we don't we what clinical disorders happen whereas if we don't if we you know uh, you know uh, incubate or if we are kind of entertain some kind of physical inactivity you know the the health ball or the our health condition you know very uh, get the easy slope uh, into the overt clinical disorders all right and if we have the susceptibility gene x that is beyond our control what happens so that also plants the health ball to towards this and to the overt clinical disorder and after that uh, you know that if that thing happens if they are we are prevalent with uh, you know uh, physical uh, we are not doing physical activity and we are having the susceptibility gene x already we are predisposed with some kind of genetic factor what is happening so then also it uh, readily falls so that's why so perhaps this actually answers all these you know comorbidity issues and all all right so this is again and why this is so because of this you know we our ancestors were uh, you know uh, they were uh, they had their activity genotype and they had their you know thrifty genotype because at that point of time they were not so sure i mean when they will get their next food maybe one week maybe one month maybe six months later so that's why they had uh, you know our original uh, you know genotype was you know some kind of thrifty genotype however now what we are ha what we have you have abundant you know food uh, we are getting food like anything that we don't uh, you know uh, at all uh, require we uh, don't eat uh, uh, foods and vegetables not in adequate quantity actually it is advisable five uh, servings a day of fruits uh, how many of us uh, get five five uh, servings of day of food i uh, challenge that very uh, few people get it okay very few people among the listeners i don't know how many listeners are there but i would say i can bet it is less than 5% okay so okay so actually we are incubating our own lifestyle and food style all right and that's why so around genome unchanged in the past 10000 years and uh, so that's why we have developed with uh, you know this kind of uh, we have pressurized we have uh, kind of uh, given some extra 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 burden on our genotype okay so that the nutrigenomics actually uh, you know now is saying that the, yes you we will develop coronary heart disease hypertension some site specific cancers and also type 2 diabetes and also might be the depression osteoporosis and the uh, weak uh, skeletal muscles and the physical frailty so all these things actually are the product of our own food style and lifestyle nothing else and you see that food pattern the what our hunter gatherer ancestors did the, they had their 15% 15 to 20% fat from their mostly from their uh, vegetable natural foods and vegetables salt very less and now the uh, the peasant agriculture is the way our ancestors started learning the uh, agriculture so then they just uh, started taking the sugar very less it was less than 5% and however so more or less the same amount of the fat and uh, the also they have taken the starch was very you know it was in large quantity at that point of time however now we have uh, 40 percent 40 percent more than fat in our diet and sugar is 20 percent and we have reduced the starch and all this fiber content okay so and the salt so these are not at all these one fat sugar and the salts not at all the healthy diet uh, okay and that this is we are incubating and also this is the transition pattern of the fat consumption in the japan okay so you see that fat consumption how it uh, grew like anything from 1946 to 1990 okay so this is the 10 threats of the global death okay so air pollution non communicable disorder influenza uh, fragile and vulnerable uh, infrastructure antimicrobial resistance ebola and other pathogen uh, infections and the weak primary health care and the vaccine hesitancy so these were the you know 10 threats uh, global uh, against the global health uh, you know uh, that was mentioned in the advisory of the who okay but uh, unfortunately we were not so prepared we were actually talking about the air pollution did we do some uh, effective work perhaps not and did we do uh, uh, develop some kind of uh, essential uh, infrastructure at least not in our country okay and so that's why the influenza threats have you know actually have uh, made its uh, solid punch on us okay and the antimicrobial resistance yes we are working we were working and uh, we have not again taken some certain steps against the ebola jica and the high threat pathogens okay so we are still under prepared and the weak primary health care still we have uh, i would uh, say that we are uh, somewhat you know developed it 
and uh, it is not in all African countries and all. And the vaccine hesitancy, yes, we are uh, we have developed something. At least I am talking about India. So we have uh, successful vaccine, uh, uh, you know, programs in India. And the tuberculosis, actually, I would end with the tuberculosis threat. It is uh, essentially the another infection that we must, you know, uh, take a note of it. And the total of 1.5 million people died, uh, died from TB in 2018. Just see the figure, 1.5 million. It is including 251,000 people with HIV worldwide. TB is one of the top 10 causes of the death, not the, you know, coronavirus and uh, all. Only thing is that what one we are uh, why we are scared of corona because of its infectivity. It is essentially very very you know uh, weak virus that I I must say that it's not so deadly as I mentioned in my earlier talks uh, that it is that uh, it is not much that deadly. Okay, already but TB is far far more deadly because it is a very slow killer and obviously if we are predisposed to with hypertension, if we are to uh, predisposed to with the diabetes. Definitely, we are prone with the more TB infection. And fortunately, very interestingly, if we are obese, uh, the TB, the attack of TB might be less. So that is a very interesting finding. Okay, that goes against the thing. But however, we we should not be you know uh, we should not be glad about uh, all that part. However, so that is the fact that it is one of the finding from an article I am saying. And uh, the multi drug resistant TB. So that is our real danger. It remains a public health crisis. Uh, in the world and after this corona crisis and along with the corona crisis i think that tb in india we must take care of these tb issues we should not spit anywhere so that is the first mandate we should not spit in the so this is not our birthright on the road okay so and if we have to use a mask it is a mandatory then we cannot we have uh, we have to take the right of the you know spitting anywhere not even in the public toilet okay so that is the that is one of the thing and we uh, if we start right from the beginning, I think we can get rid of this, you know, TB and all, uh, you know, uh, you know, in the next uh, 10 to 15 years time, uh, we, if we stop spitting in the road and public places. All right. So I've shown this and whether NCD biomarkers can be, con uh, uh, biomarkers be controlled and that uh, can abate the CD, that is the communicable disorders. Yes, certainly. Yes, we have to be somewhat alert. We have to be aware and we have to be, we have to have some positive attitude. Okay, so in my earlier talks, this is my popular uh, thing. I actually developed and I uh, actually promulgated uh, to all my friends and uh, uh, my students already don't depend on that Oxford, Chinese or any other vaccine companies because you can develop your own vaccine with your vitamin C, D, E, H and P. So C, vitamin C is the uh, vitamin creativity. It is D is the diligence for innovative work. And is the E for exercise and yoga for and meditation, H for the happiness, and P for positive living. Okay, so I think that we will win the race. Okay, don't worry about it. And this is my humble acknowledgement to my university administrators and my academic uh, for academic and administrative support uh, uh, to the uh, principal. Sorry, it is Bhavarampur Girls College and head of the department of physiology of our department. And he will talk uh, tomorrow. And to my all beloved uh, friends and students and all my funding agencies and the DST the I presented most of the work from the science and society division of the DST and I also uh, uh, did some work on uh, also from the cardiovascular health uh, funded by the DBT the Department of Biotechnology ICMR UGC CSIR actually sorry I forgot to mention the CSIR also uh, so that was on the radiation protection uh, project also so though and it is also the WDST DBT and uh, also CRNN, all right. And uh, I must uh, acknowledge my teachers uh, for uh, like uh, very many great teachers and that I must acknowledge uh, for them only I could present before you. Okay, my pronouns and regards to all my teachers. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank okay. you, Professor De. You are most welcome. This is this is for the audience if anyone has any queries please write them down in the chat box in the youtube link we will communicate them to the respective resource persons and receive answers and they would be uploaded gradually thank you yeah. okay moving on our next resource person for the day is professor chandradipa ghosh 
Professor Ghosh is presently serving as pro professor in the Department of Human Physiology, Bidyashagar University. She had completed her graduation from Presidency College on the University of Calcutta and is a university rank holder. She has completed her post graduation from the University of Calcutta. Later on, she worked in the Department of Microbiology, Bose Institute, Kolkata as NET JRF, CSIR, ad hoc fellow and continued research in the field of molecular biology and genetics, especially in the field of bacteriology. Later, she received her doctoral degree from Jadavpur University. She had received NIH USA postdoctoral fellowship and worked as postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology, University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio, Texas, USA. Her research interests include quorum sensing regulation and other cell signaling phenomenon for biofilm formation in Vibrio cholerae, including understanding of molecular basis of pathogenesis of Vibrio cholerae and other clinical environmental bacterial isolates, multi drug resistant bacteria, and anti biofilm anti quorum sensing, microbial diversity, bio remediation, and biodegradation properties of bacteria, especially for polyaromatic hydrocarbons and pesticides, and lifestyle obesity and risk of metabolic disorders in different age groups and occupational activities. She had received Shikha Ratno Sammana Award from Government of West Bengal in 2017. Over to Professor Ghosh. Professor Ghosh. Professor Ghosh, can you hear me? It is unmuted right now. Yes, ma'am, it, un it is unmuted now. OK, OK. It was not muted. It was muted, actually. Ye yes, ma'am, it was muted. So I, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me here at this auspicious day dinner. I can find my teacher here and just starting my lecture. Uh, immune interplay, this time the title of my lecture is Immune Interplay for Combating COVID-19. The picture itself shows the our aspiration at this moment. We are trying to get a, a immune barrier with us just to protect ourselves from the COVID-19 pandemic or infection from SARS-CoV-2. That is our aspiration at this moment. Uh, this is a total event globally what we are facing uh, regarding COVID-19 for the last nine months all over the globe. And uh, we are facing the pandemic that who has declared on March 11 after the death of 4,000 people and affected one lakh people uh, and that the, actually involved one four, uh, 114 countries at that moment. Now it's, uh, we know the numbers, how much people have died and how much people are affected all over the globe as well as in India. And this is a total uh, situation we are facing in the field of economic, uh, uh, economics, in the field of uh, educational fields, in our research laboratories, in our schools, everywhere. Totally, we, we are seeing the total shutdown all over here. Basically, I will not talk about very much about the COVID-19 uh, physio pathophysiological situation. The most important thing which is related to my lecture is a cytokine storm, which we find uh, that is ag aggravating the case severity in the affected patients. And that is a cytokine storm that is causing sepsis and multi-organ failure. And uh, we find this uh, that this severity is associated with a comorbid, whatever we are calling the quote unquote comorbid situation. And I, I, I will try to relate those with the lifestyle pattern, the lifestyle behavior, how that comorbid situation is caused by lifestyle behavior. Some, 
in one part is is related with our genetic construction that we cannot modify but what is what can we modify is a lifestyle behavior and how we can reduce that comor comorbid situation in our life and that has created a grave situation now uh, we are actually facing survival challenges at this moment because uh, with the progression of the uh, pandemic situation we have found that no effective therapeutic drug we we, we can actually uh, we uh, we we are unable to prioritize and several of these drugs have been repurposed from several out anti outbreak drugs in uh, that happened previously but no no drug uh, could not be formalized and for the development of vaccine we have seen several vaccines are under trial and several debate has been done regarding the changing parad changing paradigm of the vaccines by uh, shortening the time period for uh, registering the vaccines we have already seen russia has registered one and india is on its way with several vaccines but no one vaccine has come to the market still now so what is uh, so what uh, what what we can do at this moment just one minute one minute is gone <laughs> just what is a what is a challenge for us they, this this particular report in science has come out in 21st september just few days back about the about the confusion with the vaccination and total debate with natural immunity and vaccination that record has shown that there are several infection viral infectious disorder that has the infection the infection of that particular disorder has given a lifelong protection but some several other disorders that that shows are imperfect immunization property sometimes that cause ade antibody dependent enhancement response so we have found several kinds of responses with different viral disorders and that has generated uh, a lot of a lot of debate whether natural immunity immunity for us will be protective for us or vaccination will do will be effective for us and uh, what we have seen for covid 19 pandemic there there is a question about the um, b cell memory because uh, research has shown that the b cell memory response actually wanes within 4 months but sometimes it has shown a robust response within 4 months but uh, so, uh, so scientists have observed a fruitful t cell memory response in the covid-19 patients and that is a point of hope for us for the memory response re, for the question of reinfection of the of this fatal disorder now coming to our point so coming to our uh, our point so wh what is remaining race to us that is our capability to defend ourselves that is our immunity or our body defense mechanism because every organism or on this earth they survive with their own ability for protect their cell because they are born with the potential of their immunological weapons and with the help of that in those organisms it exerts their protective power to survive and that immune defense mechanism all human being they also have their own immune defense mechanism and this this immune defense mechanism by the nature of this communication cell to cell communication and cell signaling properties and its coordination with the nervous system in recent times it has been coined as a sense organ in some report it has shown as a sixth sense or in some reports it has shown as a seventh sense of our body because it it is its co close association in the in, in communication and the coordination mechanism in understanding the extra genus environment the infectious environment and intragenous transformations like transformation into uh, um, uh, into tumor tumor cells tumorogenesis in both kinds of behavior they can exert their protective barrier just for our survival so in, in the immunogenic property the our immune system they first try to understand what is native like self and and non self the, our immunological power discriminate between the self and non self and it total body acts as a country and the bed and its barrier is highly defending barrier we have and in that way we have two types of immunity one is innate what is spontaneous and 
what is non-specific, that is, it acts against all kinds of infectious agents attacking from outside or from inside, and the, uh, and we have adaptive immune response, that is a delayed kind of response, which is actually evoked whenever any antigen or whenever any exogenous agents or non-self agent invade our system and and what we have in this system, we have several cellular components, complement system, like humoral components, like antibodies we have in the adaptive mechanism. We have cell-mediated immunity, like through cytotoxic T cells and B cells. And in the innate immune part, we have phagocytic cells, like macrophages and polymorphonuclear neutrophils, and so on, who can make us safe in, in surviving with a safe, safe, uh, within a safe compartment. Yeah, we, uh, just for to secure our survival from the exogenous agents. Uh, one thing, one peculiarity I should mention for the innate immunity is the my, microbial pattern recognition is a toll-like receptor. So to, we in the in the uh, innate immune cells like the natural killer cells, neutrophils, macrophages, dendritic cells, we have a specific kind of receptors that is toll like receptor who can specifically recognize the pattern, the specific nature of the antigenic properties or from the virus, from the bacteria, like double standard DNA with exclusive RNA, which is exclusive property from a virus, flagellin with exclusive property from bacteria, peptidoglycan comes from gram-positive bacterial component. These are particularly recognized by a, a specific kind of receptors who exert specific a response mechanism against them and uh, in that way in that way we have both pat uh, pathogen associated molecular pattern molecules we call it PAMs and damage associated molecular pattern molecules we'll call it DAMs the specific structures are recognized are lipopolysaccharide double-stranded RNA unmethylated CPG nucleic acids and so on and basically for by infection or or from intragenous transformation, what happens in our system is an inflammatory response, a, a, a reaction response involving several uh, immunological uh, I, I, immunological structures within us, and that, that particular response is generated within our system where attack has been done, and that we call it an inflammatory response. And inflammatory response actually involves several systemic parts in our system like coagulation, complement system, cytokines, the mediators, exclusive mediators in the immune system, the acute stress proteins we see uh, in the outcome of the inflammation, stress hormone, several hormonal coordinator, co uh, a big part of the coordinating mechanism in our system, the stress hormones are in, involved in there, the hormokines, hormone-like elements, the peptides, several peptides, and cytoplasmic factors, they come into action to in response to the inflammatory stress, inflammatory action. And uh, what I, I was talking about, because in the COVID-19 situation, there is uh, escalating interest about the reinfection, whether we are going to be reinfected uh, after four or five, uh, five months or not. Because we see in all kind of immunological uh, reactions, there is a concept of memory that is conferred by T cell and also by the B cells who produce antibodies and the T cells, we know that they, they actually evoke the cell mediated immunity. In both the case, we see that there are memory cells, they actually, the memory cell, they, are, they actually, they are continued after the first response of the infection is over. And there is also recent uh, recent reports about the innate immunological memory through epigenetic changes in the MH, MHC1 structures in the um, in the uh, in the reactive cells and in, in both ways through the adaptive uh, uh, adaptive memory and the innate memory we 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 there is a concept of immunological memory within us and there is a total is a total technical part where we think that innate memory and uh, uh, acquired memory are separated concept, but that's that's not the truth. These both the both the concepts are actually merged together to give your overall holistic immune response. In general, for viral infection, we 
these we see four types of uh, immun immunological responses are triggered in response to viral viral infection one is through cytotoxic t cells cytotoxic factors and uh, one through the natural killer cells we know the natural killer cells are very specific for virus they can identify the down regulation of the mhc1 on the uh, on the viral infected cell so in case of covid 19 or 19 also there are also reports about the effectiveness of the nk cells and third is by interference and or and fourthly and most importantly through the re, through response generation through antibodies this is the overall circuitry that uh, come into play in case of viral infection and here the dendritic cells the antigen presenting cell they they play a specific trick to identify uh, to, to present the specific antigenic part on their surface and to generate the immune response against that now uh, uh, my main point of discussion today is the factors influencing immune system so how will we survive that is most important nowadays one one part is infection and in fact that is invading our system the other part is our response and our defense mechanism how to survive against this deadly infectious infection but deadly nature of the infection so here we see several factors on the left side we we see early events genetics gender age hormonal status these are important factors that influence our in, 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 immune mechanism but these factors are inbuilt within us like genetics we cannot easily change that we cannot easily modify these factors these factors will have their own inputs inputs in their in, um, either it be positive or either it be negative but it will have their own spontaneous input within our immune system but the other factors what we have on which we have control that is a nutritional status status diet obesity it, it's an outcome of um, outcome it may be outcome of genetics it may be outcome of hormonal factors but most importantly in one way it is a it is an outcome of the lifestyle the diet exercise is the most important factors who can give rise to obesity alcohol consumption smoking stress environmental physiological sometimes on stress we don't have any any influence but sometimes we can control ourselves to to uh, to get protection against stress so this these particular factors have are modifiable lifestyle factors those we can change we can modify so here comes the question of lifestyle lifestyle is the is a way of living is a everyday way of living in which in several parts we can choose the behavior like living conditions behavior habits whether we will sit in front of the tv and we'll take uh, potato chips or we will go through guava or orange or this kind of uh, fruits or we take vegetables that is our choice and we um, we in our own uh, conscious uh, uh, in our uh, in on our own conscious we can choose choose these particular conditions in our everyday life so that actually uh, creates a total lifestyle factors some some it's, there are several influencing factors of our lifestyle like geographical economical cultural economic level moral standards family nation religious cultural text all these are ha these have influence on the lifestyle factors what is the outcome of the lifestyle we say all together four four factors like alcohol use tobacco dietary habits and exercise becomes the most important in our daily life to to to, to be the decision maker whether we we will get certain disorder or not and whenever our lifestyle actually uh, makes us susceptible for any kind of disease that and create a chance chance it is known as the risk factor so smoking exercise excessive alcohol consumption unhealthy diets physical inactivity obesity environmental factors like whether we will we we will choose a polluted environment or not sometimes we have to choose a polluted environment but sometimes we have option to change to change that condition so if if we have a choice then we we can uh, we can shift from a polluted uh, uh, polluted environment to a non polluted environment so these actually 
it creates a it creates a condition which make us susceptible for developing several disease like if these are the modifiable risk factors like we can modify these we can make this healthy uh, and we can choose a better options which which will uh, uh, decrease the risk factors for developing several uh, deadly disease like heart diseases diabetes uh, those are mostly life threatening for us but uh, what happens in if we actually practice the no modifiable this part this particular risk factors in our daily lives we can go through a in between situation what we call an intermediate risk factors and that is that is quite alarming for us like whenever we are going gaining weight or we are getting obese we should be alarmed and we can modify our a risk factors and go back to the previous situation so if this alarm if we are not actually uh, cautious by the alarming situation generated then we we will uh, we will actually um, uh, take up the risk of developing the uh, life threatening uh, disorder the final or uh, the final stages like heart diseases diabetes stroke cancer etc so uh, who has listed the most important non -com uh, non communicable diseases like cvd diabetes copd cancer uh, and also there are asthma dis uh, disease of digestive system this is the most common lifestyle and the most life threatening lifestyle diseases it is known and these lifestyle diseases are also dependent on several stress factors those can be physical mental emotional health problems uh, and disturbed family relations most important nowadays violence cruelty also in the family or in the neighborhood everywhere so stress becomes a very important factor over over the risk factors of these non communicable diseases what we are talking about the comorbidities basically we find with the comorbidity list we find the same name of the disorders coming into the comorbidity situation so most and these are the most important lifestyle disorders so lifestyle somehow is related with the comorbid not somehow it's definitely related with the comorbid situation which is very much allowing for this covid-19 situation this is an example how lifestyle the physical inactivity alcohol consumption cigarette smoking is giving giving rise to sarcopenia this is a main reason for the degeneration of the muscle fibers so what actually what we find for the comorbid situations if we go through the this detrimental lifestyle factors what happens in our system there is a development of acute inflammation that not only not only develops with infection but it also develops with cigarette smoking with alcoholism with uh, with physical inactivity that gives rise to acute inflammation and it is if acute inflammation is taken care of and it is remitted then it is okay but a part of the acute inform uh, inflammation remains within our system in a form of chronic inflammation and basically this chronic inflammation is giving rise to the comorbid situation which ultimately uh, shapes in cardiovascular disease this 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 fatal life threatening disease this particular chronic inflammation ends up with the with these life threatening disorders basically this this particular uh, uh, figure shows the same thing uh, what i want to show, show that is the two factors that come into play the resolvins and protectins to remit the uh, acute immunity function so if they fail to do so then it leads to the chronic inflammation and uh, in in recent uh, research has shown the polyunsaturated fatty acids that omega 3 fatty acid derivatives especially the eicosapentaenoic acid and docosahexaenoic acids playing a very important role they are present in the fish fats in two days uh, two days back we had a report in a, in um, in the newspaper on the basis of a research report that eicosapentaenoic acid and docosahexaenoic acid is very play, may play a key role in 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 decreasing the severity of the comorbid uh, cytokine storming inflammatory situation in the covid-19 patient so what we see uh, as a result for uh, unhealthy lifestyle we getting a compromised immune function because chronic stress pollution cigarette smoke sleep disturbances excessive alcohol consumption prolonged excessive exercise these are leading to a 
uh, compromised immune function and that is increasing the chance of risk. So this is a chronic inflammation which, which is caused by trauma, diet, low sex hormone, smoking, alcohol, stress, poor sleeping. And in case of obesity, we see there is a development of chronic inflammation. Ultimately, it is ending up in, in disease. Cigarette smoking is most in exposure to cigarette smoking. And that actually impacts also on the immune system for development of the comorbid situations. And this is the um, uh, cytokine storming, which, uh, which we find in case of, uh, case of the comorbid situation, which cause the multi-organ failure in the, and that is actually, uh, that, that is actually coined as the immunopathogenesis or overt immune responses in case of the COVID-19 patient. So coming to the other factors which control the lifestyle and the immune immune system, which controls the immune responses in our system, because aging, age is very important. Although we don't have any uh, direct in, uh, direct control over uh, over aging, age age will act in its own way. So with aging, we see we we get an immunocompromised situations uh, that is uh, denominated as immunosenescence by the redox response, increased redox loss generation and redox response. Food and diet is very important factor in our daily life. Altogether, we actually need a balanced food among all the ingredients with the carbohydrate, protein, fat, and very, very important for infection is the vitamins and the minerals, the micronutrient balance. Uh, totally, we need in our diet. Most important, the concept has been changed regarding carbohydrates. There is a concept of bad carbohydrate and there is a con concept of good carbohydrate nowadays good carbohydrate is meant from uh, vegetable and food sources and the fiber rich carbohydrates which uh, which give you a healthy gut composition and the uh, bad carbohydrates there's rich in sugar and the starch starch materials and basically de deprivation of the uh, dietary system give us two two opposite conditions and both are malnourishment like uh, malnutrition protein energy malnutrition and other is obesity overweight and several factors that contribute to the malnourishment we see the lack of my micronutrients that really leads to a uh, immune compromised situation and uh, on the other hand, in case of this uh, natural disaster war, like a COVID-19 situation, it is also a disaster situation, which is also in, in that situation, people lose losing their jobs, losing, losing their livelihood. And that is also leading to poverty. And that is also causing, also inducing malnourishment into the population by insufficient supply protein micronutrients, insufficient household food security, unhealthy environment, and so on. Another factor that contributes most, another important leading uh, risk factor is physical inactivity. So physical in activity is a very important factor that, uh, that helps in the immunological development immunological response development or immunological strength for immunological strength in the metabolic modulation due to exercise actually gives us a very healthy immune response a long trending research on exercise immunology has shown the very beneficial effect for empowerment or strengthening our immune response so these are the specific benefits through showing uh, about with the rate of mortality with increasing exercise behavior. So sedentary lifestyle style is actually not accepted. Whatever we see in the modern lifestyle with the automation in the family, in the office, in everywhere, we, we are uh, gradually going through seating behavior. So that should be changed. We should opt for uh, physical activity. So one recommendation from the UK chief medical officer published in 2016 uh, 150 minutes physical activity in 10 minutes bout within a week and you need to do some muscle strengthening activity like yoga or carrying some heavy shopping exercising with weights and minimize the amount of sedentary or sitting behavior or sitting lifestyle and the most important part in the physical activity is a recreational physical activity it means we do physical activity during our professional works with our conditional we have conditional physical activity habituating habituating physical uh, 
physical activity, but most important contribution comes from the recreational physical activity because that is a stress-free physical activity we do in relaxed in relaxed way. And these are several kinds of recreational activities. List of those are actually uh, th those are actually recommended for a very healthy immune system and behavior. So. Uh, a, a recent report showing the balanced diet and regular physical activity together that enhance the general well-being, improve overall physical, mental health, parse it, independent living, control chronic diseases, etc. That will improve the most importantly the quality of life and immunity is a major factor in the quality of life which can protect us from the internal and external threats. What is next comes a stress that is the mental and physical stress that is uh, and in case of stress we have a reaction to that change those stress comes from works relationship financial pressures in modern life we get stress in our educational life in every day in every uh, in every day dealing with people in our uh, uh, in our home and as well as in the workplaces so Endocrine immune circuits has a very important contribution on the stress circuit because we know the HPA axis, the hypothalamus pituitary immune, uh, adrenal axis, which acts, has contribute a contribution on the immune response generation, and it it is it gets eff, uh, affected by the antigen attack when there is in, uh, uh, infection. That antigen attack actually works that that the coordinate through the HPA axis that gets activated. And this is a CNS immune system crosstalk. We find a neurological and immunological coordination through several circuits, like neuropeptidic pathway, catecholaminergic pathway through vagus nerve, through, through release of several cytokines that immune cells, they get gets boosted up to the neuroendocrine mechanism at the same time, they also their feedback action on the neurological circuitry, and we have a we see a closely integrated relationship of the immune system. And research has uh, shown that uh, this close integrated relationship of immunological system with psychological stress, uh, which is actually uh, expressed through behavioral changes, cardio cardiovascular responses, metabolic shift, and um, there is again with stress. There, there with stress, the, the circuit that is actually uh, uh, um, uh, actually affected is a sleep circuit, and that sleep has an uh, uh, integrated rela relationship with the immune system. We call it a sleep immune crosstalk because with infection there is sleep sleep deprivation, and also uh, sleep deprivation on the other hand due to stress leads to the compromise uh, immune compromise. And uh, in case of infection, we see the uh, impact on the central nervous system through the prostaglandins, uh, nitric oxide, substance free, brain, brain cytokines, and actually that leads to, uh, through the straight HP axis pathway, to, to these altered behaviors that we actually find in the COVID-19 situations. Or, and this kind of responses and aggravated within the whole population due to the fear of developing COVID-19, this disaster situation. Refine every person in altered sleep, fatigue, reduced activity, decreased feeding behavior, depressed mood, decreased sexual behavior, pain, and this kind of responses. These are actually close knit interactions between the immune system, infection, and in the central nervous system. One report says that during this COVID-19 situation, the self-confidence, that is a, a psychological intervention, social supports play a very, very important role in alleviating the comorbid situations. We see a lot of people are dying with comorbid situations. They are aggravating with the case fatalities. But sometimes the self-confidence uh, self and the uh, uh, and the associated neuroendocrine pathway can alleviate this situation. Again, another another report shows under uh, COVID-19 situation, two kinds of situation happens for depression. One is through quarantine. People are losing their jobs. They are under, uh, uh, they, are, they are going through the state of depression. And uh, in the other part, a, a, a part of people that are getting the infection altogether, they are also living, 
uh, also developing depression and which is leading to this particular state or these particular states are leading leading to depression and that can be uh, countered by the exercise response but exercise enhance the anti-inflammatory uh, actually alleviate the anti-inflammatory through the anti-inflammatory process antioxidant system learning memory neurotrophic activity etc another another factor very important is a relaxation behavior the pain relieving factors the endorphins the opioid system in our system they have a very very important input on, in our immune system because all the important immune cells they have specific opioid receptors for endorphins encephalins endorphin is a uh, prime factor here and but one thing is important so over over use of uh, we call it opioid abusers like drug users they they have they will have a compromise in their immune system and they will be susceptible for more opportunistic infections and they will have an impaired immune system another important factor we call it four four hormone factors four endocrine factors they are very that come out as happy hormones among them oxytocin has been known as a love factor and dopamine oxytocin endorphins and serotonins they actually give rise to a feel good uh, effect in our system that psychologically mm, helps us to coordinate our behaviors and to go through our positive lifestyle and we find through endorphins which has a painkiller effect uh, it enhances the relaxation process serotonin that boost our mood and dopamine is a play that confers pleasure to our system and oxytocin that actually is, is, is gives a, a feeling of emotional well-being is a positive relation with family family and friends some care some kindness that's a, some uh, thankfulness may actually uh, alleviate the situation of the immune compromisation this kind of feelings a positive behavior positive thought this way through their neuroendocrine coordination can give rise to an healthy immune system and well-being for us but uh, the, this this particular uh, this particular mm, uh, this particular responses can be uh, can be abused and in that case and that abuse should be prohibited and that will not be that will not be uh, accepted or that that, uh, that will not be uh, taken take uh, taken into account so uh, in next part we see the healthy gut system the gut microbiome the gut microbiota healthy gut the composition of gut microflora they, they have very important input to the brain they and this biosis in the microfloral uh, composition can, can give rise to depression anxiety in the impairment clouding memory so there is a close knit relationship between the central nervous system and the gastrointestinal tract which through their enteric nervous system to the mucosal immune cells the immune, immune modulators uh, through the and, and the secondary uh, metabolic products from the gut micro, microbial flora they had uh, influence on the central nervous system activity so immune system and microbiota has a great alliance we have a now, the hundred trillions of uh, uh, microbial communities they they have symbiotic relationship with our uh, within our within our several uh, several organs but the gut microbial composition gets the preference because it has been shown they, that is the most they take a central part in causation of disorder and well-being so these are the several factors who affect the uh, composition of the gut micro, microflora and here we see the several modes of communication of the gut microflora to vagus nerve to the immune system neuropeptides and microbial metabolites so one important factor that can can be incorporated in our lifestyle is a life microorganisms that known as probiotics which can modulate the gut microflora floral composition and can uh, give a healthy feedback into our immune system that and not only the probiotics probiotics behaviors are dependent on the prebiotics who are substrate for the probiotics a combination nowadays is known as a symbiotics and this symbiotic component composition is actually oriented for developing a healthy gut system to uh, to uh, actually 
prevent the destru destruction of uh, uh, to prevent the uh, the causation of several disease through destruction of pathogens and this symbiotic relationship actually prevent diarrhea from uh, constipation improve skin improve digestion and so on we see the gut microflora flora play a very important and central role because if we see a dysbiosis that is alteration in the floral composition in any other organ the gut microflora play a leading role in alleviating that situation so again uh, we see the secondary metabolites the small chain fatty acids the metabolites from the gut microflora specifically butyrate has been identified and several research play a leading role in making a healthy behavior and healthy immune system these are the development of gut microflora till birth and these are the special specific nutritional condition that can lead to a very healthy uh, healthy uh, health development of healthy gut basically non starchy vegetables nuts and seeds high fiber fruits legumes in fiber also there is also high specifications with the size of the oligosaccharides in the legumes in the prebiotic foods in the probiotic composition overall there there, there are several recommendations in several spheres next we come uh, a very important input for our immune behavior is the sex hormones we uh, there, there are several reports that women are more protected in case of the infections and it has been sh shown that this is associated with the x chromosome the mosaicism uh, in the x chromosome by inactivation Ma'am, we are unable to hear you. We have lost the connection. Yes, we have to wait. We shall wait two, three, two or three minutes. Hope Madam will join. Rejoin. Uh, it is it, it is showing in another panel. I think that is muted. Madam, please unmute yourself, ma'am. Chandradipa, ma'am. Chandradipa, Chandradipa, ma'am, please unmute yourself. Ma'am, can you hear us? It is not audible, ma'am. Please contact through phone. That's any. Huh. Yes. Contact through phone.
हेलो Yes, ma'am. Now we can see. You can see the slide. Yes. Uh, no, ma'am. I could see Omi, and I couldn't uh, find my slide. Slide is coming, ma'am. Okay. Can you see the slide? Uh, not yet, ma'am. You are presenting, but we cannot see the slide now, ma'am. We can see the slide. Okay, 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 okay. Sorry, sorry for the inconvenience. I don't know how it happened. No, ma'am. Actually, connectivity yeah. is uh, fluctuating. So there, although there have been several controversies, that research has shown that the herbal medicines and the metabolic metabolic products coming from the herbal plant metabolic products coming from the herbal medicines actually modulate the gut microbiota and in one way, in other way, they help the gut microbiota to secrete several metabol several other metabolic products that can influence the gut environment. And as and we already know that gut microbiota has a very good influence on generation of the immune response on the immune uh, immune structures within us to make a, a, to strengthen to to strengthen our immune system. So we have a little contribution because of our interest in traditional herbal medicine, and we have incorporated um, uh, uh, its effect in our present research. And this is a small contribution from our laboratory on the traditional medicine practice from uh, from this uh, from Rar and Plateau Fringe regions of West Bengal. So the why people all over the world is getting attracted for nowadays from eighty percent people from the developing countries. And uh, and more from the developed countries are getting attracted with the uh, indigenous medicines coming from several uh, countries. Uh, and why people are getting uh, attracted because effective use of them, easy availability, low cost, affordable, and this these are of low cost, lesser side. This is the most important part why people from developed countries from USA, Europe, they are getting attracted for these the, for the lesser side effects. For the cultural closeness, close to home, and these are the trusted mechanism uh, for for the for this. And uh, next uh, uh, about uh, again uh, another controversy about herd immunity. So herd immunity means when a uh, 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 substantial number of people from the community they get uh, immunized either by natural infection or by vaccination then they become a barrier for transmission. They can break the chain of transmission and that we call herd immunity. This is the mechanism, like this is a transmitting agent. If the person is susceptible, then transmission goes on. And now on the transmission line, if an immune person comes, then the transmission chain gets broken. This is the concept, this is the mechanism, how we, we can get uh, herd immunity, herd immunity and this immune person can come from natural infection. So once a lot of uh, about 60 to 70 percent people from the overall population gets immunized either by natural infection, then that then there will be a possibility of breaking the transmission chain. And otherwise, you need, need to have an effective vaccine. And this is again the hard immunity concept through vaccination. Uh, through vaccination, if some people get vaccinated, other people's uh, they get immune. Uh, they get uh, they get protected uh, because uh, if an immune person come in between, then the transmission can cannot be continued through that. So now the take home message: say, stay nutritionally sound, have healthy lifestyles, practices, do regular physical activity, especially the recreational, stress free, in relaxed mind. Physical activity, avoid stress and anxiety. I, I, I know sometimes we cannot avoid that, but we will have a positive mind, a positive thought, and most importantly, self confidence that we will win. That's the most important economy today. Stay fit, happy, and healthy.
Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Professor Ghosh, for beautifully explaining the intricacies of immune interplay in combating COVID-19. I would like to again state that if the audience has any problem, any queries, kindly write them down in the YouTube chat box. We will get back to them later on with the answers. They will be up uploaded in the website. Moving on. The resource person for the next lecture is Professor Protiti Ghosh. Dr. Ghosh is presently the professor and head of the Department of Physiology in West Bengal State University. She had graduated in physiology from Presidency College and post graduated from University of Calcutta. After her PhD from the same university, she gathered postdoctoral research experience at USUHS and served as visiting fellow at the National Institute of Health USA. She has received a, fellow, a few fellowships and awards and has numerous peer reviewed publications, book chapters and a textbook to her credit. He is presently researching on different aspects of lifestyle and stress physiology, ranging from yogasanas to P glycoprotein mediated multidrug resistance. She will be delivering her lecture on From Coronavirus to COVID-19 and Thereafter. Over to Professor Ghosh. Thank you so much, Dakshani. Uh, good evening, all of you. Wishing you all good health. And I'm thankful and grateful to all the organizers for inviting me to this August platform. So my topic is from coronavirus to COVID-19 and thereafter. We basically know a lot of it, but still there are some ins and outs which we're still not aware of. This is a scene of the different pandemics that have occurred on this planet throughout the years. There have been 12 major outbreaks in the world starting with tuberculosis, which ranged from the uh, 3000 to 2400 BC. That means in the pre-Egyptian period, in the pharaohs and the mummies period. Smallpox, which has been eradicated successfully. Measles, which still carries a vaccine. The different kinds of flus, cholera, HIV, SARS, etc., which are still yet to receive a vaccine. So what happens when there is an outbreak? The, an outbreak is suspected, it is actualized, and the fundamentalization of the interim guidelines are made, and mass awareness are spread through the campaigns so that the all the guidelines are in are in formulation with the international bodies, not only with the not only in the national approach, so that there can be generation of planning, preparedness, and response measure so that the pandemic is it can have a quick halt. The main objective of uh, halting the pandemic so that is that the, the number of active cases is mitigated so that the healthcare capacity is not run out, which has happened in the case of COVID-19 in all the countries. Starting with tuberculosis in the prehistoric humans, the Egyptian mummies are shown to have, have been seen to have possess these uh, tuberculosis in their bones and also in the Americans in the 180. Hun One million cases of pandemic TB are estimated to occur every year now with more than 100,000 deaths. One third of the current global population is in infected asymptomatically with tuberculosis of which 5 to 10 percent will develop clinical disease during their lifetime. Then came the smallpox outbreak through variola major and variola minor. And that has also been found on the faces of mummies in the 18th to 20th Egyptian, the 20th century Egyptian dynasties. It had killed up to 300 million people in the 20th century. But there has been, but we have been successful in eradication of this smallpox in 1980 only. 
There was outbreak of measles since 4th century BC and in 1980 about 2.6 million deaths occurred worldwide. But presently two doses of measles containing vaccine is routinely given to all children through supplementary immunization activities after which the mortality rate has dropped drastically. In 1918, the Spanish flu came, which affected one third of the world's population. 500 million people were affected by it, and in a span lasting for two years with multiple waves of spread. It was caused was by H1N1 influenza virus and was highly contagious. Then was the flu pandemic of 1957, with an estimated death rate of 1.1 million people worldwide. It comprised of three different genes from H2N2 virus that originated from an avian influenza virus, including the H2 hemagglutinin and the N2 neuraminidase genes from the earlier one. The 1968 flu pandemic comprised of the H3N2 virus, where which underwent uh, antigenic drift and continued to circulate worldwide as the seasonal influenza virus. Basically, it's a variation of the earlier 1957 H2N2 virus. It still affects the older people. The cholera outbreak originated in the Gangetic Plains of India, and in six subsequent pandemics, it killed millions of people across all continents. The seventh pandemic started in South Asia in 1961, in Africa and America, reached America in 1991. But it's no more a pandemic, but it's an endemic in many countries till date. Every year, about 1.3 to 4 million cases are recorded with 143,000 cases death worldwide. With Ebola outbreak, which occurred 24 times between 1976 and 2012, the original, the origin of Ebola virus is unknown, but based on the nature of similar viruses, probably the infected animals carrying the viruses could have transmitted it to other animals like apes, monkeys, dukas, and humans. Then the HIV pandemic is known to us, where probably the when the chimpanzees hunted, when the humans hunted chimpanzees for food, the virus most probably transmitted and mutated into HIV, which, uh, which when came into contact with their infected blood. The SARS outbreak in 2002 through respiratory droplets, it's quite known to us because it most closely resembles the COVID-19 outbreak. After the SARS came the 2009 flu pandemic through the genetic material which originated from three different species, the human, avian, and that further combined with the Eurasian pig flu virus leading to the swine flu. Here also, 33 new vaccination formulations were proposed, but not, none of them were successful. The MERS or the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, which originated in, South, in Saudi Arabia, it had a fatality rate more than 30%, but it did not spread so widely throughout the world, though. There was no specific antiviral treatment for that mers infection, and till date, there is no vaccine against it. So what can be the takeaways from all these pandemics so far? They are all akin to what we are facing now. At present, whatever we are uh, uh, whatever have been imposed on us and whatever uh, things have been are being done throughout the world is a conglomeration of all the results of all the pandemics. So we can see that large gatherings are stopped, health contagious methods are adopted, channel breaking the channels of communication, providing free food stuff, quarantine, temporary closure of all institutions, public education campaign, international passengers restriction designated hospital uh, assigning them to designated hospitals and home quarantines etc etc all different approaches have been taken adopting them from previous pandemics many medicines have also been used like favipiravir from influenza and ebola remdesivir from ebola covistat and dronavir from hiv Ribavirin from MERS, lupinavir and nitronavir from MERS and SARS have been used. Then came COVID-19. 
It's the largest pandemic of the 21st century, affecting 213 countries. And the curve and the India, the, the national curve, the death rate and the affected rate in the national curve, as well as in the worldwide curve, is still following an upward direction. It is said that uh, all these, it is known that all of these coronaviruses have been uh, affected to humans through bats, rodents, civet cats, dromedary camels, ferrets, and Malayan pangolins. So these health threats from coronaviruses are actually constant and long term. Why? Because they are viruses, they are all, they per, they are all pervading. There are a large family of RNA viruses that cause diseases in all mammals and birds, in some mammals or the other, as you will see here. There are seven of them affect the humans, and these zoonotic viruses cause mild to lethal respiratory tract infections. If we look at the microbial taxonomical classification of coronaviruses, we can see that uh, there are four, there, it falls into two subfamilies, of which there are four genuses, which are again further divided into two and one more SARS-CoV-2 is a, just a deviation of that. Looking at the phylogenetic tree of the coronaviruses, there's the alpha coronaviruses, which still affects us in many ways, but they are mostly seasonal. The beta coronaviruses, which mostly have uh, these uh, lethal effects. The gamma coronaviruses, which rarely affect the humans. So they have been, the alpha coronaviruses are mainly restricted to the feline species, the porcine, the pig, the canine, the bats. The beta mainly in the murine, that's the mouse and the bovine coronaviruses. Gamma are specific for birds, except it is also present in the beluga whales. And the delta coronaviruses exist from mammals to birds. So when we are more in uh, in uh, in uh, connection with these animals maybe through food or through any other kinds of activities we are in often infected with them so as we know in case of all viruses they all have spike proteins and these spike pro and they attach themselves to the um, host cell through the, the via this spike protein this new virus, COVID-19, coronavirus 2, SARS-CoV-2, it binds more strongly than the SARS did to the cells, even though the spike shape, shapes are similar. It binds to the ACE2 or the annuitensin converting enzyme 2 receptor present in the target cells of the respiratory tract. So this is the basic uh, structure, how it would look like the ORF, the open reading frames and the other proteins if that uh, and the or other the uh, RNA regions that exist there. This genome lacks a hemagglutinin esterase gene, which is characteristically found in the lineage A of beta co viruses. This is the similarity of the MERS CoV, SARS CoV, and SARS CoV 2 viruses, as we see in the top panel. So the S proteins give it this typical shape. The M glycoproteins regenerate the virions of the cell. The E help in the assembly and morphogenesis of the virions. N proteins help out with the virion structure, replication, and transcription. And the hemagglutinin esterase is normally used as the invading mechanism. This is a probable schematic diagram of the signaling pathways which are activated during this HCO host interaction through the MAP kinase pathway. Uh, the pro-inflammatory cytokines, type 1 interferons, initiating unfolded protein response, apoptosis, autophagy, etc. So looking at all the coronaviruses which we had seen earlier, this is the alpha coronavirus HCOV 229E, which is normally inoculated through the respiratory tract mucosal surfaces, and it is found, and, and the I, IF and gamma of these are found in the exudates of the national of the nasal mucosal plasma. The viral loads peak within the first three days after infection, and after that, they are dram they dramatically drop off at one week. It's almost like je oshud khele shaddin, oshud na khele ek It's the it, this this is the case of that virus. So uh, they have been they originated probably from the African hypocidiaride bats and camelids as intermediate hosts. 
is uh, incubation period is two to five days following by illness lasting for two to 18 days it's the common cold symptoms in the healthy adults but in lower but in younger children it is associated with vulnerable lower respiratory tract infections it includes the standard symptoms of common cold like headache nasal discharge sneezing sore throat general malaise along with fever and cough in some patients Immunocompromised patients have been reported to suffer severe and life-threatening lower respiratory tract infections from this, and it is epidemic in winter in especially temperate climates. So how is it treated with cyclosporin A, which is normally a immunos an immunosuppressive drug, and it replicates the and it inhibits the replication of this virus. Next is alpha coronavirus NL63 COV. It is. It originated in Netherlands. It, it was known first from Netherlands. It's a mixed viral infection, causes all the cold symptoms, including rhinitis, and is the major causes or uh, in children also before the five years of age, affecting at least ten percent of the population. It peaks during spring and summer and lasts for fourteen days almost. At present, there are no specific antiviral drugs available for treating this. And therefore, primarily supportive therapy is used, which is mostly done in case of all of, of, of most viral cases. It inhibits the critical proteolytic activation of the pro of the HCOV S protein, thereby blocking the entry step of the HCOV infection. Then comes beta coronavirus HCOV HKU1, which, in addition to all the cold symptoms, causes tonsillar hypertrophy. It's a respiratory syncytial virus and the epidemic appears just prior to the influenza season and is also responsible for the asthma problem. It is relatively frequent in adults, uh, especially during spring and summer. Regarding HCOV-0343, it shows mild upper respiratory tract infections and along with the old symptoms, it shows neuroinvasive properties. It's mostly present in winter in temperate climates. So how is it treated? Chloroquine is used against it. Ribavirin is used in, against it. Remdesivir is used in, against it, which, are all, which have all been tried against COVID-19 also. So about beta coronavirus, MERS-CO, what happens there? It also affects the respiratory mucosa where it is mediated by dipeptidyl peptidase 4 acting as the functional receptor. And it can be found in upper respiratory tract, serum, stool, urine, all of them. It causes fever, myalgia, chill, chills, followed a few days later by non-productive cough and dyspnea. A small frequency of the patients, like 25% of them show symptoms of vomiting, diarrhea, or abdominal pain. These are almost similar to this COVID-19 symptoms. So they also, they have a range of illnesses from asymptomatic to as acute respiratory illness with mild to severe respiratory courses and death. No vaccination of treatment has, is available yet, as we have discussed earlier. Uh, but administration of ribavirin and interferon alpha-2b may be of help. This is beta coronavirus SARS-CoV. The pathogenesis would originate like the others only. As we had seen, it affects the innate immune system, recruiting, uh, which cause excessive recruitment of the immune cells, but they are depleted. It affects mainly the lungs. It's a direct viral cytopathic effect, including which includes um, apoptosis also. The genetic aspects are also to be confirmed. It's not that everybody are prone to the same kind of illness. What are the clinical features of SARS-CoV? Same type as in MERS. It may include watery diarrhea sometimes, as is true for COVID patients also. The mortality rate was 10% in the third week of illness, and the fatality rate was about 50% in case of the patients who were above 60 years of age. Here, the associated lymphopenia is less severe and the radiographic damages are milder and usually they can be solved more quickly. Infants and uh, children, they had milder symptoms and had only just fever, cough, and rhinitis. Chloroquine, remdesivir, 
were showing to have promising results. These were also effective in vitro with Ebola, but disappointing when applied in vivo in the original patients. So this is how we all know that SARS-CoV-2 looks like. This is how the pathogenesis of SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2, how they would infect the cells and uh, bind to the receptor, ACE2 receptor. We would diagnose this we would diagnose it from the symptoms which we are all aware of by now. So this beta coronavirus BCO, what happens with it? It affects mainly the cattle and wild ruminants. So it affects uh, a uh, member of the subgroup 2A al along with the swine, the canine and the human forms. It also is a pneumoenteric virus. Uh, and so the less we are in contact with such kinds of meat for our food, probably it would be helpful for us. This is the structure of the tissue culture adapted respiratory B cove. Then comes the gamma coronaviruses, which we can see here. It is it, uh, it affects the beluga whales, the birds, the gulls, the leopard cats goose, bulbuls, ferrets, and all kinds of birds have been named here almost. So what happens here? That uh, the first four kinds of beta coronavirus, they generally have mild effect on the humans, but the more SARS and SARS-CoV-2, they have potentially severe effects on us. The viruses of critical concern to the poultry industry because it has earlier also affected the poultry, killing the birds and it affects meat production, egg production and ultimately causing huge substantial economic loss. The domestic pets, the cats, dogs and ferrets are also affected, especially with the alpha coronavirus. The, the laboratory animals which we handle regularly is uh, the mouse hepatitis virus, the rat, virus, they are also affected with such viruses. But the greatest diversity of coronaviruses is observed in all kinds of bats and especially in civet part. The case fatalities in the in COVID is only 2.5% compared to 10% in SARS and 35% in mers -CoV. So this is a comparative of the all the details from MERS, SARS, and COVID-19 with respect to their clinical features and the um, sex ratio, confirmed cases, death rate, etc. So, SARS-CoV affected with SARS-CoV-2, we have the fever, cough, mild breathing difficulties, gastrointestinal issues, diarrhea general body aches, pneumonia, maybe kidney failure, and we may be able to withstand all of them also. So what is the rate of survival of these of this SARS-CoV coronavirus, SARS-CoV on surfaces? It said it has been tested that at 68 degrees Fahrenheit, it lasts for two days on steel, four days on wood and glass, five days on metal, plastic, and ceramics, Though one strain lasted for up to nine days on plastic surface at room temperature. Two and eight hours on aluminium and less than eight hours on latex. The non porous surfaces like doorknobs and tabletops are better at carrying viruses in general. But the porous surfaces like money, hair and fabric, those are dresses. They do not allow the viruses to survive that long as the minute spaces of the holes in them can trap the microbe and prevent its further transfer. They remain infectious on smooth surfaces, including plastic, stainless steel, glass, ceramics, and latex cloth for up to seven days, remaining in, on the cotton clothing till four days. What's the effect of temperature? If, it is, if there is a jump in temperature from 68 to 86 degrees, that's an 18 degree jump, it decreases the that's why we uh, spray with heat, we spray with uh, steam. So it lasts less on the steel surfaces, reducing the time to at least half, as the fat layer uh, is uh, protection is gone in that case. The sheath, however, dries up, which kills the virus. So higher the humidity, 
moderate wire temperatures, low wind and the solid surface is all good for coronavirus survival. But it may be disinfected within a minute by disinfecting surfaces with 62 to 71% alcohol or 0.5% hydrogen peroxide bleach containing 0.1% sodium hypochlorite. And it could be killed above 56 degree. That is uh, sufficient to cause injury at a rate of about 10,000 viral particles every 15 minutes. There are Ayurvedic and Yunani medicines for treatment of coronaviruses, which have been uh, recommended by the Indian government Ayush portal. And they, have, they are actually probably more effective in stopping the disease, surely in combating in some cases also. There are homeopathic and herbals like Arsenic Album 30, which was said to have good effect on the virus and uh, at least as prophylaxis things like turmeric lemongrass fenugreek mori tulsi ashwagandha etc can be used so that the disease does not affect us and we can in enhance our immunity as has been discussed by professor chandri babush so this is about herd immunity which he has discussed in detail I will not go into it again. So the herd immunity threshold presently is, is good for diphtheria, measles, mumps, pertussis, polio, rubella, smallpox. But for influenza, for pandemic influenza, it's only about 40%. So there are different parts of the virus, which all of them have been used this time in generating a vaccine. Everyone has been trying to generate a vaccine. Classical vaccines need a lot of time to be generated. Classical medicines also require a lot of time to be generated. So what is done here is uh, COVID-19 vaccines are given are, are since they're in requirement at uh, with the uh, greatest uh, immediate effect. So most of them which have gained the which are which have made it through the phases of clinical trials. They are mRNA or ad 5 nco derived vaccines, and uh, they are mostly originally not the not the live particles, but the synthetic ones, from, of which the Moderna nco mRNA twelve seventy three vaccine was initially running the running fast in the game. North America, China, Europe, Asia, and Australia, different non-profit organizations, public, academic, private, as well as industry, all of them are involving themselves into the vaccine development. And it has been uh, who has approved of 11 RNA candidates, 7 DNA candidates, 29 protein subunit candidates, 6 replicating vector viral vaccines, nine non-replicating viral vector candidates, three VLP virus-like particle as uh, the candidate vaccines, three of them as inactivated virus candidates, and a live attenuated virus candidates, but they have not made into the clinical trials as yet. It is to be remembered that certain antibodies are generated by immunization. They sometimes may promote an aggravated form of the disease, which can form to more severe forms, which happened in case of SARS and MERS, which for which we really did not get the vaccine then. So vaccine should not also be safe, but also be effective. It's to be remembered that it does generate immunity, but not necessarily to all vaccinated people. So what's the immunotherapeutic profile of the COVID-19 patients? Basically, they suffer from lymphopenia, lymphocyte, Activation, dysfunction, granulocyte and monocyte abnormalities, high cytokine levels, and an increase in IgG and total antibodies. So, if these parts are taken care of by different medications, then probably something can be done with the disease. But the problem is a new disease cannot quickly come into the market. So, what is done is drug, drug repurposing from the earlier pandemics or from other uh, chronic diseases, especially which are inflammatory diseases. So what has been done is uh, enhancing the um, uh, NCOV treatment. So uh, immunomodulators are used, 
कॉन्वर्सेंट प्लाज्मा थेरेपी इज यूज्ड मिस्टन कायमन सेल बेस्ड थेरेपी इज यूज्ड टी रेगुलेटरी सेल बेस्ड थेरेपी इज यूज्ड ब्लड ब्लड प्यूरिफिकेशन ब्लॉकेज ऑफ आई सिक्स सिग्नलिंग और बाय यूजिंग जैक इनहिबिटर्स आर मेनली रन थ्रू ड्रग रिपर्फसिंग so the lymphocytes may be enhanced by nk cell based immunotherapy immunomodulators may be used by using pegylated forms hydroxychloroquine was originally thought to be very much effective as an anti inflammatory uh, dose used against malaria systemic lupus erythematosus and rheumatoid diseases the protease inhibitors are still used lopinavir ritonavir cobistad darunavir they are still used The nucleoside inhibitors and analogs are mostly used, which were used in case of MERS, COVID, influenza, H1N1, Ebola, and SARS. The convalescent ferrous plasma therapy had um, quite made its way in China, but is usually not much has not been propagated in other countries so much. Though the antibodies present in them are supposed to give a very good effect, but it has not really been used much. The mesenchymal cell uh, cell based therapy with limitless cell renewal and multiprocency and anti-inflammatory effects should be giving a good uh, good uh, head start for the cure, but that uh, transplantation also requires time and could not really be adopted that fast. Treg cell based therapy subsides inflammation in the lung tissue, and they are all in the trials. They are all being tried to be used. especially those used in rheumatoid arthritis and myelofibrosis the il6 signaling blo blockage uh, medicines are also used especially those used in all kinds of arthritis the new therapeutics are also on the way which are not yet uh, the which haven't yet made it into the human trials though the vaccine update would be like covid shield of oxford university and covaxin by bharat biotech they have made it into the phase 2 and 3 and should be out by 2021 so what do we say that we have been trying so much so hard to get these things out so what uh, probably could be the some are surviving some are not surviving so what could be the um, reason Maybe according to in the line, in the lines of Charles Darwin and Jean Baptiste Lamarck, maybe who were the proponents of the theories of evolution, and who always insisted on survival of the fittest with the changing environment. Maybe we can say that not all fall prey to these pandemics. Only those who possess the deviated metabolism due to comorbidities or have a deviated trend of immunogenic potential. they often succumb to this disease like those who are having those uh, cytokine storm and immediately get cancer yeah so he who has health has hope and he who has hope has everything after the worldwide uh, shutdown lockdown due to pandemics this is the picture of the kolkata skyline after a shower which a lot of us have definitely seen this is a smog free picture of delhi before and after the shutdown similar case in bangalore this is the case in uk wales where the mountain goats have made it out into the roads this is the skies with smog free uh, in as it was earlier the yellow ones was earlier and now presently in china italy is air quality has also improved so is has new york and los angeles the venice gondola where the boats were used to shuttle they were ex extremely dirty and nothing could be seen down but now the fishes can also be seen from the top which has made it very clear since due to our non usage the deer have also been spotted in japan there's a peacock in dubai and ducks wandering in the streets of paris and puma in chile londoners also spotted a wild fox in their street so that's how there has also been probably some air quality improvement with the lockdown at least if not with the covid 19 thank you thank you madam thank you professor ghosh for the insight into the various aspects of the corona virus and covid 19 i would now like to request our convener dr shruti ratan tripathi to kindly introduce our next speaker for the day dr amit bondobadhyay over to dr tripathi yes thank you dr amit bondobadhyay
is now assistant professor department of physiology in university of calcutta formerly he was the senior lecturer of physiology school of health sciences university sense malaysia kelantan malaysia and assistant professor department of physiology institute of dental sciences bareilly uttar pradesh his research interests include sports and exercise physiology ergonomics and work physiology he is the fellow of international college of nutrition he is the life member of the physiological society of india indian science congress association and federation of indian physiological societies he is presently the honorary treasurer of the physiological society of india he has published 107 research papers in journals of international repute he has received several prestigious awards including awarded by the physiological society of india with sakuntala dasgupta memorial oration professor shrutiputi chatarji memorial oration etc and is the editorial board member and reviewer of several internationally reputed peer reviewed journals dr bondopadhyay please thank you very much dr tripathi for your nice introduction of mine good evening ladies and gentlemen i think you we are all uh, set to uh, go for the last lecture of the day and uh, am i uh, allowed to present my powerpoint now am i clearly audible to all of you i am audible audible thank you very much so first of all before entering into my lecture i would like to thank the organizers the borampur girls college as well as the physiological society of india for giving me this opportunity to share my views about the covid-19 pandemic and in this aspect first of all before entering into the lecture at the outset i would like to mention that i am not going to talk about physiology i am neither going to talk about sports and exercise physiology which is the field of my research interest but today i'll be sharing my personal views and some of my experiences which i have come across during the last 6 months of this pandemic situation in the country especially in west bengal and particularly in the city of joy kolkata So ladies and gentlemen my topic is transforming scenario to sustain healthy well being during covid-19 pandemic so whatever the situation was whatever the situation is and whatever the situation will be the main foremost objective for us is to live a healthy well being in spite of having lot of confusions and uncertainties in our mind yesterday before finalizing my powerpoint i had just a glimpse on the statistics that how many deaths and how many affected Uh, cases are there in india it is around 5.73 million people were affected and a significant number which is 4.67 million have been recovered from the disease and the death rate is around 91000 in west bengal the affected uh, case was 231000 uh, 231000 and out of them 202000 people have been recovered and there are around 4483 cases of death throughout the state so considering this pandemic i would like to uh, i would like to recapitulate the incidents which started in china and that was coming into our mind since end of 2019 and during the end february or during the middle february to middle of march the situation started to aggravate it in our mind that what was going to be and around 22nd march 2020 our honorable prime minister mr narendra modi ji announced on behalf of the central government a symbolic initiation of lockdown phase that is 20 that is the janta curfew and it was a successful one indeed on the very next day that is on the 23rd march 2020 uh, the government of india in discussion with the other provincial sectoral governments like state governments or uh, uh, the other parts of the country and men they decided to declare the first phase of lockdown and further there were extension of lockdown in multiple phases depending on the situation of spread of the disease uh, in the community so during this particular phase of time which i am talking about around march or in march when the first phase of lockdown started 
or even during 17, 18, 19 March, when we attended our university for the last time, we were also thinking that what was going to be. And the entire country was in a state of complete confusion and uncertainty. Nobody knows what the disease is. Nobody knows what the uh, what is going to be and how many uh, people would be affected, what can be done to get rid of this problem. So all with all these uncertainties, we have come across six months of life. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure that you will agree with me that at that time we did, did not even think that we could come across this period of time with such uh, immense challenge. Six months, that means half of a year, is not a matter of joke. We stayed completely confined within the house. The beginning of COVID-19 pandemic in India is uh, quite, uh, has come a lot under criticism in the media, in the social networking sites. But what could have been done at that time? Although it doesn't make any sense to uh, utter all these words at this point of time, but at that time, we know that the disease was not originated from our country. It originated from somewhere else abroad. So what was the cause of spread of the disease? Is this a lack of awareness or lack of undergoing quarantine processes? I think lack of awareness cannot be the sole reason. Lack of undergoing quarantine process cannot be the sole reason. But there were some other factors which could have been done at the time to save the country. For example, whatever may be the cause, whatever may be the effect, whatever may be the uh, reason of spreading the disease, it is very much concluding that this disease spread from people who came from abroad to India. It is my personal view that if at the time the government of India would have announced the stop of international flights, then we could save our people from this deadly disease. But the question comes, if we would have stopped the entry of people who were in the overseas countries at that time, then where they would have gone? I would like to mention that at that time, the government could request them to stay back there and the government could pay the money to them for their uh, regular expenses over there. Second option, according to my opinion, government could ask them to come back to the country and at the point or port of entry, they could restrict their movement and they could take the whole passenger, including the crew members and the people who are in the airports dealing with these people, to enter into a phase of quarantine. Government could spend the money over there. I think it would have been economically much, much better for the whole nation. But unfortunately, might, we, we might not have thought to this extent as it is happening right now. And perhaps uh, at that time it was not thought even. If it could have been thought, then I'm sure the governments would have taken this kind of steps. <clears throat> Another question comes, uh, did we follow the lockdown properly? I think it is a debatable matter and everybody knows the answer. So I'm not going into that debate any further. One question or one terminology that we commonly introduced, that is social distancing, which we mean to indicate a distance between two people or people, uh, many people at a particular point where they are gathering. But I would have, I, I have certain reservation to this terminology. Social distancing is not a solution. Rather, we should not go for social distancing. We should maintain social, uh, uh, social bonding in a better way to fight this corona disease. I'm thankful uh, to the Bongyo Big Gang Polish, which I have come across few days back in literature, they have changed the terminology to physical distancing. Their opinion, I absolutely agree with them that, ladies and gentlemen, we should not maintain social distancing. If someone in, uh, in my surroundings, if someone in my locality gets affected with a coronavirus, and if I maintain a distance with her or him, I think it will make a lot of impact in her psychological uh, aspects. So we should not uh, call it as a social distancing, rather it is a physical distancing, we should maintain it as around six feet or like that. During this process, we have come across several new practices which we might not have done before. We are wearing masks, we are wearing gloves, hair cap. Some people are using eye protectors, which looks like spectacles. Face shields are also being used by people. 
We are cleaning hands frequently with soap and water. We are sanitizing our hands. And if we go out for any kind of emergency work, immediately upon returning back to the home, we are washing our clothes with soap and water. We are taking bath with, uh, with uh, shampoo and uh, soap. And we are cleaning our goods as well, which we are purchasing from markets. You can keep, you can uh, clean the vegetables in running water. If, but as far as the grocery uh, materials are concerned, you can uh, keep it uh, aside for a few days. And after that, you can touch it to uh, avoid the spread of corona. And we also have avoided to wear ornaments and wristwatches because scientific literature has indicated that these coronaviruses survive on the metallic surfaces for a longer period of time. So that is why uh, it was inst uh, instructed to the common people in, through the media and other uh, social networking sites by the doctors and physicians and scientists that we should avoid wearing ornaments and wristwatches to get rid of this coronavirus infection. Another question comes, we are wearing masks, but are we wearing the mask properly? Because there are questions that which type of masks we use, which type of mask is proper, uh, giving proper protection to us. Because the coronavirus spreads through droplets, and ultimately it was said that three-layer masks are most useful, and we are wearing those three-layer masks. But the question is, are we wearing the mask properly? All the time we are wearing the mask so that it can cover our nose and uh, mouth region uh, properly. Sometimes we see that people are talking to one another when their masks are hanging below the chin, which makes no sense, actually. Sometimes we are seeing that the masks are hanging from the ear. So if we are wearing masks, then we have to wear it properly. Is gloves really needed? Some people are saying, yes, the gloves are needed, but for a long time use, it may cause some sort of skin problem. So those who are vulnerable to skin diseases, they should not wear the gloves properly. Rather, they should wash their hands or sanitize their hands frequently. Even sanitizers also cause irritation. So better to not to use too much of sanitizers in a particular day. Rather, we should wash our hands frequently. So what is the ultimate reason? We got confined within the home for the last six months, unless and until there is an emergency piece of work, and starting online activities with work from home and academic activities. People who were in the private sectors, people who were in the uh, software sectors, they were using this work from home culture for a long period of time. But people like us were not at all associated with this kind of work from home culture. So this corona pandemic compelled us to learn all these things as we are doing right now by attending this webinar. And I'm very happy to know that a few minutes back, I just went to the YouTube link where I found that approximately 17 to 18 participants were there. And in this particular, uh, yeah, in this particular uh, Google Meet, we have approximately 10, 11 participants. If we add together, we have a number of participants of approximately 30 individuals. I know that how many in how many conferences at this time of around 7 7:15 in the evening, 30 participants would have been available. So in that way, we are very much benefited with this system. So academic activities are also being conducted. But who are at the maximum risk of chances of infection? We are academicians, colleges, universities, schools. All are closed. We can stay inside the house because we don't need to go to universities or colleges or schools to teach our students. Online modes of teaching are going on. But there are many people who have to go out because it is the minimum necessity for their work. And they are none but the doctors, healthcare workers, police people. Cleaning personnel, security personnel, people who deliver materials, especially the food items and other things to the homes, and workers of ration shops, etc., etc. I could not accommodate all of them, or I may not remember all of them, but they are the people who are fighting with corona at the forefront, and we should salute them for their immense effort during this last six months of corona uh, pandemic. And I do not know that how long they have to do it. Some of the sectors were open because of us so that we can live our life properly. They helped us a lot, like bank. Bank people started to work even after uh, 15 days, fast 15 days of lockdown. Or I'm not sure that whether they uh, did not stop their work at all. But yes, there may be physic attendance. There may be cluster of uh, uh, employees they selected so that they can work on uh, different, uh, depending on making different rosters. But whatever may be the thing, 
they were working night and day and night to help us out to get our life normal to remain in our normal life so, but they were at the risk all the time so potential risk of infection are markets public transports which have started with a lot of stipulations but they are not followed if you go out to the streets and find the buses are going on the public transports are going on vehicles are going on full of packed up passengers during the office time it is not the scenario of Kolkata, I had been to my native place in Hooghly district at Puidabati for the last few times. I found that the local buses and autos, and there are totos as well, they are running with uh, full packed people. So there is every possibility to get affected with the corona if any individual is vulnerable to the disease. Doctors' chambers, hospitals and health centers, these are the potential risks uh, uh, containing regions where there is every chance because no, nobody knows that the uh, patients who are staying there, who, who is uh, who among them is uh, affected with corona or not. So the most important apprehension or tension or anxiety that prevailed in our mind that what to do if someone becomes severely sick and need hospitalization. The same thing happened with me during the first week of April when my mother got severely sick with dehydration and electrolyte imbalance. She needed immediate transfusion of drip. I'm thankful that I, we got a physician who stays nearby to our house and he gave us overnight support. He infused the deep in the house and my mother could survive. But this may not happen with everybody. At that time, even transports were not available. You could not go to the hospitals regularly or morning in the evening or you could visit your patients. Even it is still now there. This situation is still prevailing in the hospitals and other uh, healthcare sectors. If you go to the hospitals, there is every possibility that you will get infected. Now, there are some social impacts as well of this situation. Confinement within the home for six months is not a very uh, silly matter. It is not a uh, simple thing. Yes, now even I sometimes uh, become quite surprised to think that for the last six months I am staying at home. I visited the science college, my place of uh, work only uh, twice or thrice for some ex examinations needs. Uh, Professor Dr. Devachish Bhantopadhyay, my senior colleague is here, who also was with us at the time whenever we visited. It is around two or three times we had to be there. It was, we were compelled to go there for the benefit of the students, for the sake of the students to make their results out. But you think about those people who were working in the private sectors or other spheres of the jobs where there is every risk of job security. At any moment of time, their job can go. They can lose their job. There is every moment it is there in their mind that I can lose my job tomorrow morning. Even in the evening, an email can come saying that my job is no more. Financial crisis was there. There was a cut in the salaries. Anxiety among the students. Mm -hmm. Students were thinking that what would happen when our results would come out? What would be our mode of teaching? The internet connectivity issue was there. Even we were starting the uh, uh, online classes. Many of the students were staying uh, in the remote places, they were complaining that, sir, we are not give, getting the connectivity. We are not getting the proper internet connection. Even when we started, the, uh, I'm talking about my experience. Even when I started my classes uh, during uh, April or May, uh, end of March, I found that only 18 students out of 41 total number of students could join my class. The rest of the students could not join. So at the time, I was feeling a little bit disappointed. I was feeling, I was thinking that whether it would be ethical to conduct the classes because most of the students are not able to join. So later on, the situation improved a little bit and I continued taking my classes for them. Even during this particular phase of time, we were unable to visit our near and dear ones. Even when my mother was dying because of the problem of uh, dehydration, I went to the local police station and requested permission, seeking permission to allow me to go to my native place. They said, no, you, you will not be allowed. Even many, many incidences happened at that time. Parents died, nearer, dearer people died. They even could not visit them. We know that several celebrities, I'm not going to name them, but their parents, their mother or father died. Even they could not visit the uh, house to see the last uh, glance of their uh, mother or father try to realize the situation, what they have for the remaining part of the life. This is the extent of, this is the extent of failure that this coronavirus did for us. We are even unable to attend the funeral or cremation of the people. If some of my family members get affected, 
and unfortunately if there is any death they are not allowed to visit the patients uh, during the funeral the body is being taken by the uh, healthcare workers for the cremation you cannot cremate you cannot even attend the funeral procession so this is the situation we had come across and even we are going through and i do not know how long we have to go through this situation right now so we had to put some good terminologies to satisfy our mind nothing else so we gave a name that is new normal what is new normal that is we are working from home digitization of the academic activities the question comes how far it is acceptable to the students and teachers the teachers were quite okay with the situation because it is for me only to get the internet connection the gadgets and everything but from the students point of view if you think like that there were a lot of problems financially all are not belonging to the same level all of them do not belong to that particular region where we will give uh, internet connectivity throughout the day and night so there were a lot of questions at that time the situation has become a little bit of streamline nowadays but if we think about 4 5 months back situation was very much adverse but is it always bad for uh, in our society is this corona uh, imposed all the bad effects i don't think so there are some good effects as well because the kids are at home they are confined within the home if they don't have any job if, if they don't have anything to do then they would have become frustrated so i would like to say that schools are conducting classes they are giving assignments they are sending questions they are asking them to do the answers get them back with the screenshots and all these things so they are doing these things they are enjoying this mode of teaching they are enjoying to come they are enjoying to doing uh, to do all these online assignments and the most advantageous thing is that they have learned a lot of thing about the online meeting platforms that we are using nowadays the zoom network the uh google meet or anything else the teams whatever you say i think uh, what i experienced myself that they know much better than me if you ask them what are the advantages of this uh, meeting uh, platform they will say this meeting platform can do all these things but they cannot do these things but if you go to that platform it will have some other benefits and other demerits as well so they have become acquainted with lot of computer operation system lot of digital operating system like uh, internet and all these things they have also become very much friendly they are very much acquainted with the uh, smartphones but yes definitely there are some stress and distress of everything the main problem is connectivity issue most of the time i should not say most of the time but several times we face connectivity problem as um, also happened in case of when professor chandrakar goes was uh, delivering a lecture so this kind of intermittent troubles come but keeping apart keeping that apart if we think about the problem if we think about the thing i think it is better for the kids community that they get engaged in these activities and this help them to uh, remain busy with some sort of activities throughout the day i problems there are it is a it is a very very grave situation today because most of the students who are participating in these online classes i went for for the ophthalm uh, i met an ophthalmologist uh, last month and uh, he told me that a lot of cases are coming most of the <coughs> cases are belonging to the kids <coughs> excuse me so they are having some eye problems because of this prolonged exposure to the screens whether it is a laptop screen whether it is a smart phone screen whatever it is but they are getting affected another important thing that we in the normal middle class people think that we should not allow the kids to get involved or engaged with the smartphones and all these gadgets because uh, it harms them but the situation compels them to hand over these particular things which we were not interested to give them we are willingly today giving it to them to fulfill their activity so it is their addiction that has developed to these gadgets even when these smartphones are not required to, to them they are also taking it up checking the whatsapp checking the emails and all this thing if i ask them hey why you are taking it now oh i'm sorry so what does it mean it means that they have become addicted they have become addicted to it they know that at, at night around uh, 10 o'clock 11 o'clock then the teachers are not going to send any message to them but they are because of addiction opening the uh, gadgets are kids exposed to extra extra pressure sometimes i feel that yes the kids are exposed 
to some extra space pressure because what they used to do in the schools they are doing it at home they are remaining busy they are getting involved with some activities they are learning a lot of things in the digital medium they are learning a lot of things in the uh, online system but i think some sort of pressure is there they are not being able to communicate with their friends they are not being able to communicate the way they are habituated to and they are after all confined to the home for the last 6 months so definitely i am sure they are exposed to some extra pressure university colleges and education system are also uh, undergoing this new normal phase with the classes which have been conducted online but we are sometime also facing uh, facing some sort of difficulties failure of students to join because of connectivity problem unavailability of the gadgets to all the students most of the students complain that sometimes they don't have the laptop they don't have the desktop so they cannot uh, complete the assignments on proper time and ultimately we have a question of adaptability because all of us were not very much equipped with the system but thankful to the coronavirus that it has compelled us to get acquainted with the system to get adapted with this particular uh, software hardware whatever you say or the digital medium and all these things also at the time we are also compelled to reschedule our work normally we used to take the class in the morning time around 10 o'clock 11 o'clock till 5 o'clock but now because of this a uh, tremendous uh, load on the gadgets and uh, this uh, online system we have to change our schedule of work say for example most of the time my kids are using this laptop desktop smartphones internet everything in the uh, day time when their school time is there for uh, from around 10 o'clock to 3 o'clock in the afternoon sometimes the classes take place in the 5 o'clock in the evening so i have to reschedule my class in the evening around 7:30 8:30 even uh, later than that so we have to uh, reschedule our work depending on the resources but thankfully we are staying at home we can do that but whenever you are working from home thank you speaking there are some domestic disturbances as well because if you are at home it will be taken for granted that you are available to do some help to the people who are staying with you sometimes your father comes to ask something sometimes the uh, people comes uh, rings the calling bell uh, are you there at home something to talk to you Uh, some people come sometimes the newspaper fellow comes sometimes the other people come sometimes there is some other request from your neighbor so there are domestic disturbances so these causes some sort of intermittent problem when you are attending your classes or attending your office work or whatever it is online examination system has also been initiated we are also planning for the fourth semester final examination along with the practical examination in different modes the project presentation in a different mode but yes we are doing it for the sake of the students for the sake of their future we have to do this phd students are also submitting their pre submission seminar and proposal presentation seminars in the online mode but there are merits and demerits as well if we talk about the merits yes the system has got merit because students do not need to stop their work because they have a bright future ahead if they have if they are not given this opportunity then they have they will face a lot of problem because they have to wait for submission of these things and what are the demerits i would say the feedbacks which generally come from the audience who are listening to their seminars that normally is not happening with this system in that way so physical interaction is not there digital interaction is there but i am in doubt that how much efficient is it but submission of phd thesis has also been initiated through online mode university has provided links all the universities are now accepting this online system of thesis submission submission of the name of the examiners and etc so these things are going on so these are definitely the good thing good part of this uh, uh, of this corona pandemic which helped us to know all these things and we are organizing webinars as we are doing right now and uh, this gives us an opportunity to attend uh, the webinars uh, sitting at home even the youtube uh, recordings are there so if we are unable to view the direct telecast then we can go for the lecture at a later session depending on our convenient time so in a live you know new normal system i say that live local but perform global so you live locally at your home but you can perform globally you are staying at home in a uh, in a very uh, short span of space your home or your flat or whatever it is so you were staying within that particular stipulated place you are not allowed to go out because of the pandemic but you can perform globally provided you have the proper gadgets and proper internet connectivity as in your house but unfortunately this creates a misconception in the mind of the people that i can approach anybody at any time because she or he is available at home 
throughout the day because of this confinement. But this is not true. Everybody is busy. Everybody is busy in different types of works throughout the day. Since we are staying at home, it doesn't mean that we are available to everybody throughout the day. We are getting involved in household works. We mean I'm talking about those, uh, mainly the working people like me, who are not at all involved in any household work. But now we are doing a lot of household work. May not be properly as our uh, uh, as our uh, uh, homemakers can do, may not be into that uh, level of efficiency, but to some extent we can help them out because a lot of pressure is there on the homemakers nowadays because they have to tolerate us, tolerate the kids, tolerate their, uh, uh, tolerate their family, other family members who used to go out, but now it is throughout the day they are at home. So they have to provide food, they have to provide everything as per their requirement throughout the day. A lot of pressure is there on the homemakers. So we are trying to help them out. So these are the new practices. These are the transformation that has taken place in the last few, mo few months. And the and that, I'm sure that there were some works which we could not do because of lack of time, which we could not take out from our regular activities when we were their old normal life. But now we had that opportunity to take out that and then work. And we perhaps could come out with some solution and we could perform some of them. That is why I have put this terminology done the undone and ladies and gentlemen if you could not do it i would like to request you to do it it will help you out so for example i'm talking about myself i had some data in my file which i could not work out during our normal university life but during this lockdown period i could take out the data i could work out on them and i could fortunately come out with all your blazings and well wishes a couple of publications were there so these are the things we could mix up with the people which we, are, uh, we could mix up with the people through the online video conferencing system, video call, my telephone call, etc., etc. During this period of lockdown, because we had some time, we have some time in our hand. So these are the things which we could not do at that time, but now we can do it. Changing job profile of daily wage or under unorganized sector workers. I have seen the people who used to work in the uh, shops or who, uh, were involved in the daily wage kind of thing, we did not allow them to do the work because the shops were closed due to, due to the lockdown. We did not allow the domestic maids to come to our house, so they lost their job. They were not able to uh, get the money because uh, they were daily wage workers. So some of them were selling vegetables, some of them were selling uh, fishes, some of them were selling some other articles sitting at the side of the roads. It was very, very uh, disappointing. It was very, very unfortunate for us to look at them at that time. Even uh, uh, fortunately, some of these sectors have opened uh, in the last uh, one month or couple of months and they have again uh, got engaged. But for that particular two, three months of time, they had to suffer a lot. So there is a changing scenario in the life pattern of these people. Some sort of modifications also took place because throughout the day and night, many doctors, many health uh, experts, they were explaining what to do, what not to do, etc., etc. And diet was one of them. They were asking to take those diets. We are rich in vitamin, especially vitamin C and D, along with some supplements like zinc and other uh, minerals, which improves our immunity level, because the only the thing which is immunity that can provide you safety and prevention to get rid of, uh, become protected with this particular deadly disease. I have seen many people are doing exercises, started doing exercises because this uh, information is also there in the media and in the social networking side that you have to do exercises, especially the breathing exercise, because it's the lung, the most potential organ of your body is the lung, which gets affected with the coronavirus infection. Therefore, to save your body from this infection, you have to keep your lung clean as far as possible. So they were asking to do breathing exercises, yoga, pranayama, etc., etc., and some sort of walking. And I have seen that people are walking on the uh, roof and walking in the roads when the, the, the roads were empty. But unfortunately, some uh, adverse effects took place because some people did not know that wearing masks plays an adverse role and it creates some dangerous uh, health effects when you are uh, walking or doing physical exercises. So there are some incidences, there are some reports that people wearing masks and doing exercises got affected with the breathing problem and some of them died. So if you were doing exercises, if you do it properly, especially the breathing exercises and other things. Another unfortunate, another questionable thing in our mind is the vaccine. Tremendous confusion is there that when it would come, whether it will at all come, whether the vaccine which will come into the market, will it be able to protect us 100% from this disease or partially? 
few uh, few days of uh, a few weeks back we had the we had the impression that russian company has come up with the vaccine and it is going to be marketed very soon where it is the oxford university market is still undergoing the trial the vaccinologists are saying that it, it is not so easy to come up with a vaccine so rapidly it takes a lot of time so let us see when the vaccine comes so again another confusion in the new normal era the most million dollar question is when normal life will be back when we will get back to our original life which is the old normal i think if this is the new normal then that should be old normal several worst affected countries have regained their regular life uk usa some other parts germany france they have regained their life our friends and relatives are there i asked them that how did you recover from such situation which we could not they said only one moral thing that their governments requested them to stay within the home and they followed this instruction very very meticulously judiciously and carefully they did not go out unless and unless and until there is any emergency real emergency requirement even uh, sometimes this was supplied to them by the government official government persons or uh, suppliers like that so they stayed inside the home perhaps we did not we went out we did not wear the masks properly we did not follow the standard operational procedures so that is probably the reason why we are lagging far behind is further lockdown a solution sometime it comes in the newspapers and other media that government may come up with another period of lockdown yes it can be a solution but the thing is that lockdown should be a real lockdown the lockdown should be followed properly then definitely 21 days lockdown we can solve this problem but what about those who have already been affected they have to be taken into quarantine they have to be taken into such a uh, such a uh, situation, such a position that they will not come in contact with anybody. Is it possible in a country like India where 130 crores of people are residing? I don't, I don't know. I don't have the answer. I'm sorry. So where are we right now? This is the question. Where are we standing right now? Many sectors have opened. Thousands of cases are being reported nowadays. Hundreds of people are dying. Maybe because of corbidity, may not be because of corbidity, whatever it is, corona is there. So where are we right now? I would prefer to stay, prefer, I would uh, prefer to say that we are still at that position where we were during the end of March when the lockdown was not initiated. Because corona pandemic is still in its peak form right now. Otherwise, thousands of people would not have been affected with the disease. So it is a big question that when we will be able to get rid of this problem. I mean, to the theme of, the, of this webinar, so what can help us to get rid of this situation? Fight together to move forward. We have to fight together. We are fighting together. But ladies and gentlemen, we have to fight judiciously. We have to fight following the standard operation procedures. We have to fight following the proper uh, guidelines which can protect us from this coronavirus uh, virus. Then only we will be able to get rid of this situation, otherwise not. Before ending my lecture, I'm sure uh, uh, some of you, uh, most, of, most of you will be, uh, uh, will be in agreement with me that whatever I say, that is the scenario. So this is, these, are, this is, these are the different phases to which we have come across. Some points I might have not uh, covered in my lecture, but there are some other things. This is the general experience, general uh, daily uh, routine work that we have come across in the last six months. You are also aware about these things. This is the thing which I have shared in this particular uh, webinar. I, I, I took the help of this platform to share it with you. Uh, so if you enjoyed my lecture, then I'm, I'm it will be, I, I shall be obliged to you. It will be a privilege. And I, if I bore you for the last half an hour or so, uh, then I'm sorry for that. So I would like to once again thank the organizers, especially Dr. Tripathi, a very good friend of mine, for giving me this platform to share my views and the Physiological Society of India. This is my email ID where you can reach me anytime, any moment. If you have any query, if you want my personal views in future, and I have specially put this particular thank you slide because I want to get back to my department. I want to get back to my blackboard and chalk. So thank you very much. And I hope you will fight together. 
uh, it will join uh, the hands together so that we can fight the coronavirus and we will get back to that old normal life our regular normal life very soon thank you very much for your patience here thank you dr bandwadhai thank you dr bandwadhai for briefly uh, stating the different situations of the new normal we are facing today and also stating the pros and cons of the present day life in the covid pandemic area with this we come to the end of today's session and i would like to sincerely thank all the honorable resource persons and principal ma'am bahrampur girls college the entire organizing team for being with us and the audience for having patience in the entire conducting webinar thank you over to our convener dr tripathi yes thank you sir thank you madam each and everybody uh, good night so now we, we we will end now we are in ending this webinar and uh, we will meet again and uh, tomorrow at 2 just work for the next couple of days of webinars to all of you Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everybody. The next, the next session would resume tomorrow at two p.m. sharp. Thank you. क्लोज कर दो रेकर्डिंग बंद करो सुन दो चैनल खोला बेरोके ঠিক আছে ভালো হয়েছে খুব ভালো হয়েছে পরে মানে তোমাদের সিদ্ধান্তটা শক্ত করে রাখতে হবে এটা বুঝতে পারছি রোজ দুটো থেকে 8:00 টা অবধি ঠিক আছে স্যার ওকে অল দা বেস্ট হ্যাঁ ঠিক আছে তোমাদের তো সবটা মানে তুমি দাক্ষায়ণী তারপরে ওদিকে চন্দন তিন জনের টেনা দেবে আর কি ওকে ঠিক আছে ঠিক আছে শুনুন ঠিক আছে বেশ বেশ অল রাইট One of the, you come to the